Hello there, and welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with I, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 771, that is Siete Siete Uno, with I, your host, Agostino Zinger. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope, I hope, and I pray you are doing swimmingly. How am I? All good orphans considered. I really cannot complain. So how am I? All good, all things considered, I cannot complain. I really cannot complain. It's interesting, right? Because I just got back from the gym and I find it very interesting. The different vibes, the different ambiance, the different personalities that you see in a gym, depending on what time you go. When I'm going in the morning, just before work, like let's say like any time before 9am, I find that the people in there are a little bit more locked in and focused. There's less distraction, less people like people watching, no one really on their phone as much, not a lot of chit-chatting. Everyone's kind of got their little workstation that they're working on and it's almost like it's in and out because obviously you're doing it for work. Like even for myself, I mainly work from home, but even if you're working from home, you still have to like be in and out for in an hour. Because you got to go home, shower, change, eat your breakfast and then bang onto the computer. Or if you're commuting somewhere, you've got to count that in there. And then I find that when I go in the evening, technically after work times, there's still people there. It's obviously busy, but it's a little bit more lackluster, a little bit more lackadaisical, a lot more talking. Um, machines are, are packed. Weights are all over the place. Everyone's just in a bit of a disarray. And it just feels a little bit chaotic. And sometimes you have that situation, which I usually hate, is where I have to talk to somebody. Because I have a rule, when it comes to the gym stuff, like there's no communication. There needs to be no talking. It needs to be the complete opposite of what you do in your regular life. You go and you lock in. It's like going to a library. You shouldn't go to a library and start trying to make friends. You go to a library to revise. You go to a library to read. Whatever you meant to do. That's what you go and do. You don't go there to kind of turn it into another social club. So I've always kind of detested that sort of thing. So I'm happy to see that in the mornings, especially, that seems to be the best actual time to go. So I'm going to start doing that more often because I've been switching here and there. I've been going in the evening. If I do my tour days, I obviously go in the morning and the evening. But now I'm just going to stick to the before 9 a.m. because that's probably the best time to go. It's absolutely, you know, prime time with all the serious people. There's equipment still available because no one really wakes up, you know, no one's ever going to wake up before flipping 9 a.m. to work out for the most part, especially in the area that I live in. So you usually get a good community of people. So I really do like that. I'm not going to lie. I really did enjoy it. And of course, this time around, I didn't get vibed out. Nothing nonsensey happened in that regard. So I cannot complain. I cannot complain. So um, before we head into today's show, I received some very interesting feedback and news which I'm not too sure if it's legit or not. I mentioned it um, the other day on the random show when I was streaming and I thought I'd just mention it on here because this is the best place to sort of talk about this sort of stuff because this is the number one cultural commentary podcast in the world. So as you guys know, I'm a nightlife aficionado. I'm a nightlife fan. I'm a nightlife freak. I'm a rave addict and I DJ. So I go out a lot. Sometimes I go out probably a little bit too much. Sometimes I probably do a little bit too much. And sometimes I probably say a little bit too much, but it doesn't matter. I flip and love it. I flip and love it. And part of loving it is falling in love with clubs, falling in love with electronic music. One genre in particular being techno. You also got house, you got disco, all that malarkey. Along my journey, I obviously discovered some of the great clubs out there. And one of the best clubs I've discovered over the years has been Bergheim. I've loved the place. I've been going there for like... I'm going to say like 10 plus years. It's probably been maybe more than that, but I've been going there for a very, very, very long time. Um, the first time I actually ever went there, I went by myself. So I've had every experience of being there with friends, being there on my own, uh, being there with quote unquote locals. I've done the whole shebang. I've done everything that you can expect when it comes to that place. And when I mean everything, I mean everything. Whatever you're thinking now, yes, I've done it. Okay, cool. So I've enjoyed it and it's been really great. But it's also, I feel like, been an education because it's it's informed my clubbing behavior and taste across the board. It's kind of had, it's kind of made me appreciate how they do things over there. It's also made me question the wisdom of it, 
Like it's it's good in general, especially when you live in London. We don't really have a door picking, you know, um, culture here at all. Zero. It doesn't really exist. Most clubs let anybody in as long as you got money. Most clubs don't even care if you're drunk or high. They just want your money. So the atmosphere and the vibes in the clubs are a bit weird. So whenever you go to a place like Berlin for the first time or in Amsterdam or whatever, or Madrid, or Barcelona, anywhere that's got like a little bit of a more of a sophisticated club life, and people maybe take the, their jobs in club culture a little bit more seriously, and they're not just a transient kind of like, you know, you know, whatever job, they're kind of like a career thing, which is what they do in Berlin, which is a bit different than other places, it almost makes you appreciate the other side of it. Maybe you won't want to live there, you won't want to copy that in London, whatever it may be, but it just gives you an understanding of like, okay, this is why they do it like that, you see the results of it. You see why they do it when you go inside. You're like, oh shit, look how fun this club is. Look how everyone's so free. Look how everyone's dancing. No one's on their phones. Everyone's in the moment. It makes you appreciate that sort of stuff. So it's all good. So anyway, long story short, obviously I'm a great fan of the club. I love it. I've been there many, many a times. I have aspirations of in the future playing there one day. And I'm pretty sure that will definitely happen. Um, whether it's Panorama Bowl or Burka, and I'm pretty sure that is definitely in my destiny. And it's going to be a monumental moment um, considering the amount of times I've spoken about it. But I've heard allegedly via somebody who left a comment on one of my videos that I've been put on some sort of blacklist at the Burkhain. I've been put on a blacklist where they're essentially trying to dissuade people who make content like I do, centering around nightlife, centering around dance music, centering around techno, centering around, you know, techno tourism, because they don't like the attention that it brings. Maybe I'm assuming, maybe they don't like the things that the people say, maybe they don't like the cut of their jib. I don't know. But in general, the funny thing is, is that they're kind of grouping me in with those TikTok techno influencers you know like that girl that i spoke about um who's german i think as well who everyone was kind of ragging on they kind of grouping me in that sort of same group of people the ones that everyone gets annoyed by the ones that do the get ready with me as i go to Bergheim, the ones that wear harnesses and pvc and mesh and whatever as like a uniform just so they can go in certain places all those people they're grouping me in with those people so i was dunking on these guys and girls I was dunking on them. I was flexing on them. I was almost acting as if I was cooler than them because I wasn't like them. But then on the other side of things, Berger and allegedly have decided that I am just as bad as those TikTok influencers, which is hilarious when you think about it. But when I was thinking about it a little bit more, I was thinking to myself, if this is true, it's almost as if they're trying to like silence people from talking about the club. And I find that incredibly weird because I understand how controlling, how controlling and how picky, good, pretentious, selective, exclusive they are when it comes to how they manage the club. Because obviously it's worked for so long. It's worked so long. They know what they're doing, right? From the bouncers to the people that work there, the booking, it's fucking kill it. They have, you know, a program that runs what? Basically 12 months of the year. Um, open you know from Friday all the way until Monday they have great flipping booking great programming great flipping promoters it's all really done well so they know what they're doing they're not flipping idiots but it's also one of the worst kept secrets in the world there's a ton of articles written about Bergheim all the time there's a million videos many more on YouTube that have many millions more views than I and plenty of people leaving reviews and stuff on red like there's plenty of places where you can find out and read about Bergheim. So I just find it utterly odd that they would get annoyed by like random YouTubers who are just sharing their experience of going there. And it's not as even like because I understand there's a there's like a bit of a taboo, there's a bit of a nace, it's a bit, it's a bit it's looked down upon if you describe in detail what goes on inside, who you see, whatever. I don't think I've ever done that. I don't think I've said, oh, I saw a so-and-so celebrity. And I don't think I've gone into excruciating detail about what I what I saw other people doing even. It's just more so about my experience. Oh, I had a good time. I was dancing until this time. I was tired. This person played amazing. That's just like my experience that I had. But I don't see how much more I could limit without then having the feeling as if like they're controlling what I'm saying and you never want to get to that point of view you never want to get to that point where you feel like someone's controlling your speech like what the hell is this 
Like, it's not that deep. It's just a fucking nightclub. So if it is true, it's unfortunate because that means more than likely because, you know, I've got a very obvious and um, I've got a very, uh, you know, I've got a very unique face. I've got a very big head. <laughs> so most likely I'm not going to blend in or go incognito in some sort of flipping, you know, disguise. So, you know, if 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 it, if it transpires, I am actually blacklisted and banned from then i can't go i'm probably gonna find out this time well i'm probably gonna find out next month because i do plan to go over to berlin next month um for this particular program they have at the end of the month they have a bite night um happening or beta i guess happening at the end of the month um 24th of may um which features people i want to see like filmmaker pablo buzi the hacker um neuromancer and then on the following weekend or the following day, sorry, on a Saturday, they have a standard club night happening. And a standard club night who I want to see, Ben Sims, obviously, UK stand-up. Bestie Hero, I've always wanted to see because they've been getting rave reviews. I think they've played the Bergheim quite often these last few months, I think. So it feels like they're always there every every 18 months or so. So I really want to see them play. Obviously, Luke Slater. And then in Panama Bar, you've got Dinky, who I want to see, John Talibot, Mike Starr, and Vlada. So there's a good like lineup of people i want to see so i'm going to get an accurate idea of if i'm banned or not when i do go into the month but i just find it hilarious if that's true i find it absolutely hilarious like how much more control do you need you already control how people you know you already control who comes into your club right you cover their flipping phones it's almost like a unwritten rule that you shouldn't talk about what you see on the inside now you want don't want people to talk about it on their own platforms or to make a it's like it's insane it's literally insane if that is the case but maybe this also is part of the reason why it's such a good club maybe this iron grip that they have almost similar to like an iphone right you know like um, apple have the walled garden with the apps they don't really let you do anything on there maybe that's part of why apple have been so successful over the years it's not like a free-for-all you can't just make any app it sort of has to exist within the app store has to pass certain criteria meet certain standards blah 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 so maybe having an iron grip on things is the best way to go about things but i also do like the fact that throughout this time that i've been doing this podcast i always have said that this podcast has always been like a a little bit of weirdly therapy for me because i don't really have a big social group I've never really had that many friends anyway, and I usually keep myself to myself. Um, I found that I was doing a lot of these things, having these weird internal dialogues with myself, and it was a bit worrisome, right? I was having these full-blown conversations with myself about things I was doing. So I thought, you know what, why not turn on the microphone and just talk about it like online? And, you know, most likely you're going to touch and speak to more people online than you would do any anytime, you know, in your flipping real life. And more likely than not, because it's online, you'll probably end up finding loads of other people who are just like me. And I did. Throughout doing this podcast, I found out that I wasn't that special. And there's tons of people out there who also don't have many friends and who usually stay by themselves or go out by themselves or whatever it may be. So there's a little bit of kinship there. But I also have been very staunch, very steadfast in always being a consumer, always being a customer, always being a fan first. I've never done this under the guise of I want to get friendly with people. I've never done this because I want to get invited to be like friends with the people that own Fold or friends with the people that own, but I, I don't give a fuck. I literally talk about these things because I love them as a fan and that's it. I'm happy just keeping my arm's length. I don't want to know anybody. I don't want to be friends with anybody. I don't care. And I think that's been a benefit for me. But it's funny that even though I've gone out of my way not to try to be friends with anybody and just talk about the things I'm talking about, buy my own tickets with my own money and go to the parties like any other normal person would do and not try and be like a media person or make this into like a nightlife report. Like I've not done any of that corny shit. I'm still getting dinged. <laughs> That's the funny thing. I've made it a very, I've made a very deliberate stance to be like on my own do my own thing but i'm still getting grouped in with influences who everybody seems to hate which is i guess what it is, isn't it technically on paper because i put content on social media i have to be grouped in with these people do you know what i mean i can't think i'm better than them we're all the same do you know what i mean the people who put a phone on the wall and then step back and start doing all those poses i'm just like them 
I just sit in a chair instead, you know? I think I'm better than them because I don't sit on the wall and do all that shit. But I'm still the same. We're the same people. Hence why we're getting treated the same. But, yeah. Because I'm trying to think of it now. The only time I think I had an attempt at doing the whole friend thing, it didn't end well. And I think that, and and again, that that's something that I've been very conscious of because I know how sensitive I am. And I know I don't really play, you know, industry game, which is which kind of explains why... I never really advanced in certain areas I was trying to go in because I was never really good at playing that sort of game. But the last time I did that was with the DJ um, Law Croft, who I was a fan of for a while. And then I think I made a video about something that she posted and then she didn't like it. And then she was like telling me in the comment, in the DMs, kind of like what I should do and what I should say and delete this. I was like, look, go fuck it. Like in my head, I just said to go fuck myself. I didn't say obviously in the text, in the DMs. I just said like, go fuck yourself. And since then I legitimately have deleted her from my brain i haven't listened to a single set don't give, give, give a fuck if she's playing on the lineup i won't go and that's not good obviously you know what i mean because that's what happens when you start talking to people you start to you know take what they say personally so i prefer not to do that i prefer just to be like an outsider i wouldn't want to meet somebody and then they turn out to be a wanker and now all of a sudden all that investment i had as a fan i have to kind of take it away now because i don't like you as a person do you know what i mean and i don't want to do that so Hey, if that's the case, you know what I mean? And a man's been banned. It is what it is, isn't it? I'm locked up. You know what I mean? It is what it is. What can you do? But I'll guess I'll find out when I go to the end of May. And then obviously, if I do get denied and they say no because you're on some list, I'll also make a report about that. So it'll be a report about getting in. It'll be a report about not getting in. And it's all going to be absolutely flipping hilarious either way. And um, yeah, man, it's just a funny state of affairs. What a funny state of affairs because I love the place, but... I'm not willing to fucking, you know, suck people's dick to go to a club. It's not that deep. Like, I love the place. It's a great club. I would prefer not to be blacklisted, of course. But if I am blacklisted, then so be it. You know what I mean? Like, what can you do? But I'm not, I'm not willing to get down on my knees and suck somebody off just to be able to go to a club. It's not that deep. There's plenty of other places I can go to. Hopefully, I hope. Hope it's not a worldwide ban for all clubs. <laughs> but yeah, we'll find out. We'll find out when I'm there. We'll absolutely find out when I'm there. But funnily enough, actually, I saw this clip that features this DJ called Chloe, who basically speaks about um Bergheim and how she perfor- per- you know prepares for her sets and what she likes about it and specifically about Panorama Bar and you know what's funny about her comments you know what's actually funny about this woman's comments about Panorama Bar this is exactly the reason why I love the place also she said some very astute things that I kind of wanted to play here just to kind of give you an idea on like my mindset when I'm going in those kind of places but obviously Chloe's far better you know she's amazing like an absolute legend in the scene so Chloe has very interesting views about playing in Panama Bar and why she loves it so happy. and now in a couple of hours you will play in Panorama Bar and I was just asking you because so many artists say that it's very special to them and as a club goer by the way this woman's voice for playful mag why is why is her voice always like hoarse is she like does she sing is she in a metal band does she go to concerts every weekend every time i play a clip from playful magazine this woman's voice is always gone like or maybe she's got something wrong with her and i'll take it back but it's her voice is always gone in some regard it's super funny i also think it's an amazing club but why would you say it's special for you yeah, it's very special for me to play uh, at uh, Panorama Bar, going Bergam first, because uh, I mean, this place is just amazing because it has its own singularity. The building, of course, is like just a special piece of art, I would say, like the architecture is just amazing. So you would definitely not find another place like this in the world where there's like big parties going on. But also the atmosphere is very special, like the sound system and yeah, and I feel that it's very peaceful somehow. And uh, yeah, and, and I have the feeling also by playing uh, four hours is special because you have the time to bring something special, yes. You know, generally when I'm booked in a party, um, like uh, I usually play like for it's like two hours, which mm. is great. And it's um, generally like peak time. 
but there in Panorama Bar, you never know exactly when it is the peak time because I have the feeling it's always the peak time. <laughs> and it starts at midnight the day before, you know? So yeah, yeah, I kind of like this. Like we just all express ourselves um, with our own uh, identity somehow. And yeah. I like it. I always like to find some nice and share the desk with other artists just before and after, you know, and it's great, yeah. That's a really good point that she made, which I never really thought about, which is really different from any other club. Because it's open from Saturday till Monday, there is no peak or off-peak time. Like, even at my lowly level, usually you're playing, like, within, like, one hour to four hour blocks. But they're usually any time between, like, 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. And usually you'd say the peak hours are probably between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. But Bergheim, because it's open literally from Saturday night all the way to Sunday morning, Sunday mo Sunday night, Monday morning, there is no peak or off-peak time. And people are coming in and out. It's quite a transient place. Um, obviously, the turnover is super high. Rejection rate is super high. Oh, no, turnover is not super high, but you know, well, you know what I mean. Rejection rate is super high. So people are coming in and out all the time. So there is no, like, you know... And whenever you go in there, whenever you enter, you feel like the night is just getting started. But people have been in there probably like 12 hours before you or maybe even more. So it must be a bit of a mind trip as a DJ to go in there, which is probably why people say it's quite hard to play there also, because you can't really play like you would a normal gig. Like, oh, I'm going to play my peak set, because what if the time that you go in there you realize the vibe isn't quite what you brought in your tunes. So you kind of have to bring tunes where you kind of can go on a journey, which is probably why they give each DJ like four hours minimum, from what I could see anyway. On the lineup, everyone kind of gets like four hours. That kind of gives you a good time to sort of like, you know, figure out which direction you want to go in. And you get a chance to like catch people. You can kind of take them on a journey. Okay, cool. First hour is this, second hour is this, third is this, and fourth is this. As opposed to like two hours, someone comes and sees you the last half an hour. And then by the time they're getting into it, you're kind of gone. It doesn't really feel that right way. It doesn't make any sense. So that must be an interesting challenge in itself when you're playing there to have all that stuff going on. But I would say if I had to pick as a room, which, you know, you don't get choices probably, I definitely would prefer to play in Panorama. That room is like super amazing, especially with the blinds, sorry, the windows, everyone dancing on the edges, seeing the back of the of the room as well. It's one, you know, because it's all on one level, seeing all the way to the back of the bar, all the hands, the smoke machine. It just feels like an absolute vibe. So that must be really cool to play there and, you know, have people so close to you have that fucking massive booth with all the metal all around it. It's probably a really good feeling. So big up Chloe for describing that very, very astutely. Big up Chloe for describing that very astutely. Oh, and big up Young Old Vibes as well in the, street, in the chat. <laughs> no, no, no. I promise it had nothing to do with coke in the bathroom. Definitely not. Um, If it was that, I'll just say. Definitely isn't nothing to do with that. I don't know. I think from what I, from what I can surmise from what the person said, it seems that Bergheim just don't like people talking about the club in general especially YouTubers. I think the one who really fucked it up was this one dude, some American guy, like you probably see him on there. I remember his video too. He's got a video where he speaks about like his experience, like in detail about like what drugs he did, who he was with, what person, what that person did. And it's just a bit, it was a bit too much. It was a bit, you know, clickbaity, whatever it may be. So, um, and I remember reading the comments, people were really upset with him as well because of the detail he went into. So I think that guy kind of set like a bad precedent. I think so. But again, you know, it's his experience. He went there. Like, I don't, I don't understand how somebody can kind of tell you how you should talk about something. It's fucking insane. But whatever. It is what it is. If Burkine want to ban, ban man, let them ban man. I did nothing wrong. I did absolutely everything correct. I did nothing wrong. I did absolutely everything correct. Moving on from that one. Moving on from that particular topic. We have to, we have to, we just must talk about this flipping Quavo track. So Quavo decided to clap back at Chris Brown and decided to release this track called Over Hoes and Bitches. And it's hilarious because now out of nowhere, Sweetie has come out and essentially said, you know, what Quavo said in this lyric is not particularly true. But it's an interesting back and forth regardless between these two guys because I think we're getting... Far better disses or far better back and forth from these guys than Kendrick and Drake. 
Kendrick still hasn't replied back to Drake, even after Taylor made, even after push-ups. We still have not heard back, heard from him. But we're getting some pretty, you know, racy, dicey, dicey bars and really direct fucking lyrics and a lot of good music from Chris Brown and Quavo. Especially in Quavo's case, this is the best stuff he's done post Migos or post Take Off Death. Like he's been pretty he's been a bit he's been a bit uninspired, he's been a bit shit. His solo career hasn't really popped off as much as he was when he was in the Migos, but this has been some of his best work he's done. And I feel like this particular track is really, really good. Like even if it's not a good diss, it's a good song. Which I think nowadays is probably the most important thing when it comes to diss records. It's not really about you making a good diss record. It's about it being catchy. And sometimes in a social media age, if your song's catchy, you win. So this is Quavo over Hoes and Bitches, which is a clap back to Chris Brown's previous song that he put out. And it's pretty decent. I'm not going to lie. It also features a takeoff verse, um, or sorry, a takeoff hook. Um, that's obviously really cool as well and kind of reminds you of how much of a legend he was and how missed he is. So R.I.P. take off. The thing I don't like about these bars is that we heard the voicemail. You know, that's the thing that's crushing. Chris Brown kind of did well in that track. He had a recording of allegedly Quavo on voicemail saying to him, I don't want no beef. I don't want no smoke. I don't want to fight. Sounding very scary. So it's hard to hear Quavo talk with this kind of bass in his voice when we heard you say you don't want to fight him and you're kind of scared. But it's still a good tune. Niggas ran in your house, tied up your aunt cause you ain't paid. By the way, that's a very interesting story too that people don't know about about Chris Brown's family or auntie getting um burglarized and kind of kidnapped. And allegedly the story is that, you know, Chris Brown owed some money or he was getting extorted. A LA seems like a grimy place for gang for gang banging. Ever since WAC 100's introduction to the internet and Big U and stuff. I've almost started to believe now all the conspiracy theories about LA people and shit. They're very grimy, very snaky. So it wouldn't surprise me if Chris Brown, who is allegedly meant to be a blood, kind of got, you know, in a sticky situation with some people and end up extorting them for some cash. The story went away. No one kind of, you know, spoke. <laughs> cocaine got him your honor it's actually quite funny though because when you strip it back Quavo does sound kind of confused like why are we beefing are you are we beefing over a girl that not that both of us aren't fucking anymore like what what's that like what's going on here what are we doing here he's actually confused it seems like he's actually confused like come DMs, which is a bit lame, but hey, which kind of made Quavo look dumb because I think the DMs show Quavo simping and saying, oh, we used to be together or something like that. So, you know, you say you could take make any girl into a, into a sweetie, but you're also begging back for the sweetie.
Um, Chris Brown now says that he's not going to reply back. It's not worth a reply. But I think it is. I think Quavo snapped. Maybe not as good as Chris Brown's clap back, but, you know, it's worthy of a response back. I'm enjoying it. I'm not going to lie. And like I said, it's brought it's brought the best out of Quavo. This is the best I've heard Quavo sound post, you know, Migos and during his solo career. So I would like to hear some more. Hopefully we get some more lyrics. Hopefully we get some more bars and it keeps it there. But regardless, I've really enjoyed it. So big up Quavo. And let's hopefully hear we get some more from these gentlemen going forward. We can only hope. We can only, only, only hope. Moving on from that one, moving on from that particular one. Can we just talk about this quickly? Because I don't understand why this guy is smiling and he's happy about this and kind of reveling in it, because I think this is kind of embarrassing. I spoke about it before, but I want to just highlight it just some more, just to drum it home to some of my male listeners out there, my men's, my mandem out there who flipping listen to me for some time, for some reason. I honestly don't think... If you're a cool, you know, inspirational, um, you know, important, culturally important, really flipping, you know, artist and kind of Kid Cudi, I don't think it's worthy being this cool dude who created this amazing sound, who's got these amazing hits, who's been part of some amazing records, who's released amazing albums. There's no point in having that coolness and having all the cool tattoos, all the cool clothes, the cool shoes, pull for performing at all these amazing places, if you're unable to jump from a stage that is barely six feet high, there's nothing cool about that. There's nothing cool about being Kid Cudi and you have no athletic ability to jump from a stage that isn't even six feet high and land on the ground without breaking your foot. That is quite embarrassing. And that just shows you why I've always said I think it's it's so important for men especially to play sports as I was at a serious level but con, you know consistently from the ages of like 0 to at least 13 so you have a good base of knowledge of how your body moves coordination you also have knowledge and experience of how to fall correctly how to tumble how to roll with your falls how to jump from a tree down onto the ground how to climb a gate all these things are super important as a man, I think, in general. Or just as a person, forget men, just as a human being. It's important to know how to move your body, how to, you know, prevent yourself from getting hurt, how to kind of, you know, regain your balance when you're kind of falling over. Just general things. And if you're kid cutting, you're super cool, right? Imagine not being able to jump from this looking type of a stage, not even six feet high onto the ground without breaking your foot, especially the way that he did it. Look at how he fell down. And he broke his foot. With a song playing in the background, it's hilarious. <laughs> Look at the sign they make. The sign they make, he's out. The X, the guy makes the X sign. He's out, he's out, he's out. <laughs> We've got a foul at the front of the stage. Bro. Somehow Kid Cudi decided it was a good idea to jump from it. If you again, if you're not watching the video, Kid Cudi is dancing or is performing on stage at Coachella. He decides he wants to jump down and kind of connect with the fans. And he jumps from the stage, but he jumps sideways. I've never seen anybody jump from up up above to the ground sideways. That's what fucks him up. He jumps side. You're not meant to jump side, you're meant to jump forward. Bend your, jump forward, bend your knees as you land. It's not that difficult. But he decides to jump sideways. And obviously, as he jumps sideways, his back foot, or I think his back foot, kind of gets stuck and he kind of buckles underneath it. And one, his, his foot stays still, but his body moves forward and, you know, it goes crack. And something obviously happens. Maybe it's his ankle, maybe it's his foot. But look how he's jumping. Like, who jumps sideways onto the ground? It's a crazy angle to jump like that. And also... He didn't need to do that. There's clearly different things there. He could have easily just, you know, lowered himself there and then jumped from that particular barrier or lowered himself into one of the other boxes and jumped a bit shorter. He didn't need to jump so high from so high up, especially if he doesn't have the minerals to do so. And look how he lands. Look, he's kind of in a good position there. But then as he lands, he lands sideways. You know, look, like he's, he's side on. His back is facing us. 
Like, how is that even possible? And I think that all comes from guys who don't do sports. There's been a big, I, I don't know, I've seen loads of dudes nowadays just say, oh, I don't watch sports. Cool. Don't watch sports if you don't like to watch sports. But not being able to know how to move your body, not being able to know how to, like, run for a bus or how to run upstairs without tripping over or how to, like, you know, jump off and off, a, up and down a curb on a bike. Those are really important things to know how to do. And I feel like nowadays, guys are just a bit useless. Like, what's the point of having a body if you don't know how to fucking use it? It makes no sense. And obviously, here's Kid Cudi sending a tweet. This is my first... Sorry, this is me right after the fall in the ambulance. All smiles like a G. No pain could have stopped me from feeling the joy I felt from the show. To everyone who came out yesterday and has been checking in on me, sending love, I fucking love you. Coachella, that's how we rage. You know how we do every time. Festival card, always a dope experience. Yo, it's embarrassing. Don't make it seem like it's a rage. It wasn't a rage. You tried to jump from the stage to the ground, barely six feet, and you broke your foot. It's not like he's fat and he's got too much weight and he couldn't support it. No, you just have no coordination. You have no athleticism. You don't know how to fucking move your body. So what? again, what's the point of having all the cool tattoos or the cool clothes if you can't jump from a stage that's barely six feet high? It's utterly, utterly, utterly embarrassing. Like, really? Because if I'm not mistaken too, foot injuries take a long time to heal. There's loads of little tiny bones in the foot. So this could be an injury that is kind of, you know, God forbid, but touch wood, but it could be an injury that can reoccur. Like, you have to be very careful with your feet. And this guy just, like, gave himself a fucking broken foot for free because he doesn't know how to jump from the stage to the ground. Like, it's not even that high. It really isn't that high at all. I've jumped from higher trees, from higher walls, and this guy broke his whole foot. <laughs> so useless like what <laughs> the crescendo ah oh, it's so hilarious they were just standing there looking at him like yeah this guy broke his foot oh mate honestly what an absolute idiot but anyway um godspeed to kid cuddy hopefully he gets better soon hopefully he gets better soon but like i said it's his own fault and there is a message true you know Every, everything is content nowadays, right? You fall from a stage onto the ground and you can't do it correctly. You should feel a little bit ashamed, right? You should be a little bit ashamed that you did that. Well, not in this day and age. Kid Cudi's now made it into a whole media thing. He put out a video statement now in his hospital, I guess hospital bed or maybe bed, talking about what happened. Let's see what he's to say. Hey guys. Uh, yeah. Um, shit got real yesterday. This is... This is what happens when a 40 year old man tries to prance around off stage like he's 26. You're 40, bro. You're not 60. Steven Tyler is still dancing around on stage with skinny jeans, jumping up and down, doing burpees and backflips. Steven fucking Tyler. And how old is Steven fucking Tyler? How old is that guy? He must be like 75 or something. Steven T Taylor, how, Steven Tyler, sorry. How old is he? How old is that motherfucker? He's still on stage, six, 76, 76 years old. And he's on stage with skinny jeans and fucking Cuban heels, dancing, prancing around, live on stage, doing the damn thing. And Keith Cut is here. I'm a 40 year old man. I'm like, bro, man, come on, man. You're just washed. That's what you are. You're fucking washed. Too much time snorting, too much time smoking, and not enough time picking up a fucking dumbbell or some kettlebells. Come on, man. Like you used to do back in the day. <laughs> uh, I learned a valuable lesson. No, no more prancing around jumping off stages. Um, uh, I'm hoping... Aren't you embarrassed? ...that I'll be healed up in time for tour. Um... That's the plan. Um, I don't want to let you guys down. Um, no, nah, let us down, man. Let us down. So, we don't want to see um, you. Let us down. Yeah, that's the that's what we're aiming for. So, uh, not canceling anything just yet. Um, <laughs> just gonna wait and see how things. Need that going. money in it, huh? Need that money in it. You're kind of regretting it now. You need that fucking festival money, don't you, brother? 
Festival money is in jeopardy now because you couldn't jump from a six foot stage. Absolutely embarrassing. Absolutely embarrassing. But hey, what can you do? What can you do? Moving on from that one, let's move on from that and let's talk a little bit about Supreme. So Supreme 30th anniversary is happening. Obviously, some of you guys know I'm going to buy the box set. It's a free volume box set um, of t-shirts from Supreme's founding in 1994 up until 2024 of every single t-shirt Supreme have made from long sleeve to t-shirts. Every single graphic will be in that book. It's going to be a tome. It's going to be, I think, $168 or something. And I'm going to buy all three volumes, of course. I think, no, you can only buy it as a free volume anyway. In conjunction with that, Supreme are also going to release a t-shirt and the t-shirt that they've designed, according to Supreme Drops, big up Supreme Drops on Twitter and other social media places, they've um, got the pictures of the 30th anniversary t-shirt and it's a, basically a t-shirt within a t-shirt. It features the first ever t-shirt Supreme ever designed printed on a white Supreme tee. The blurb, Supreme 30th anniversary first tee releasing this week will be available in white, black, khaki, 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 navy and red. Design pays homage to the very first Supreme tee ever made, which was signed in 1994 by over 100 skaters, artists, friends, and Supreme crew back then. The original tee, without the signatures on it, was released in 1994, as said, and then reduced an unofficial authorization from Columbia Pictures to use in Taxi Driver's image. So as you can see from the image available in the Supreme Drops Instagram, or sorry, Twitter, you have a you know a white t-shirt with also the print of the t-shirt on it, which I think is pretty cool. Um, there's been some people online who don't really like this design. They feel like it's lazy. They feel like maybe the Supreme 30th design should have been something more substantial. Maybe they were looking forward to a box logo that might have featured the old store design in the background, the box logo, whatever they was expecting. I think a lot of Supreme fans are a bit upset that the 30th anniversary tee isn't more substantial than this. The only thing that could have been done a bit differently, I think, if I was designing it, would have maybe to have done maybe a, a re, maybe just re, maybe just done a copy of the actual signed one. So just make the tee and, you know, obviously with the print of all the signatures on it. Or sell two different ones. One with signatures like a friends and family and maybe one plain that people can then get signed if they want to at their local store and shit. That might have worked. But I quite like this. I think that looks pretty cool. That is like a piece of Supreme history. So you've got you've got the you've got the mix. You've got a t shirt on the front, the print that features a t shirt from nineteen ninety four. And then you've also got the t shirt it's printed on, that's from two thousand four. So you kinda of got a double you know, a double tribute kind of piece there going on. So I'm not really mad at it in the slightest. I'm not really too sure what people were expecting, but I actually don't mind it. I think it looks pretty cool. Um, it's also available in red, obviously. You've got the navy, you've got the brown khaki looking, obviously the black. But I actually like it. I'm not going to lie. I really do like it. I know people don't like it. Maybe if you wanted to be extra picky, maybe they could have made the t-shirt way smaller on the, the printed. Maybe you make it the same size proportion as the box logo. That might have been really cool to have like a really small t-shirt in the center of the t-shirt. That might have fucking worked. But overall, I think that's pretty cool and I don't mind it in the slightest. And I definitely will try and get my hands on that when it does eventually end up dropping. And obviously, we've got some more pictures there. I think these are from, maybe this is from the inside of the book. I'm not too sure. But this is like a collage that features images over 30 years of Supreme Store. And when I saw this image, you know what it reminded me of? Back in the day... I think nowadays I'm not really as obsessed with literature from Supreme because I've got quite a bit of it and I've read all the magazines. I've got all the lookbooks and stuff. I've got PDFs of stuff that I already have. But I remember back in the day when I was getting into streetwear the, and obviously skateboarding for the first time, I loved the idea of Supreme and I also loved more so the kind of the people that basically made careers off of being associated with Supreme. Like they're kind of, you know, all the people that have kind of passed through the doors, all the people that work there and done great things. It's pretty crazy. Like how many people have gone on to create amazing brands who have kind of ended up working at Supreme or probably are still there doing their thing. So that's been a pretty cool thing to see this be like an institution, like almost like a, like a training ground for creatives and artists and designers and whatnot, brand people to kind of learn their trade and then go and do other things going forward. And sometimes just like a, as like a litmus test for what's cool and what's not. And it's pretty impressive that they've managed to do that throughout the years because even though Stussy have kind of come back nowadays and Stussy are definitely a force to be reckoned with when it comes to, you know, consistently dropping amazing streetwear collections, I don't think 
Stussy really cares about being cool. They just care about making great clothes. But Supreme have managed to care about being cool while still being cool, which is very hard to do. Maybe nowadays some would argue Supreme isn't as cool anymore. It's too corny. Loads of kids wear it. But it's still got a little bit of that cachet. It's still got a bit of that je ne sais quoi. It's still got a bit of that star power, that sprinkle. Whenever a store launch happens, everyone's there. When there's a book released, everyone wants to get what well, everyone wants to be seen at the store, like in a good way. People want to be friends with the fucking sales assistants. I'm sure they get a lot of people begging for discounts. Like it's one of those places that has remained quite, you know, well regarded in the culture, despite it becoming extremely, you know, omnipresent, extremely popular. Um, to the point where some people maybe think it sold out, especially since it got that big cash injection. But I think they've maintained a level of core that's very hard to do over the years. And that really does need to be kind of praised and recognized. Obviously, continuing on with the core, they also had a launch for the actual Supreme 30th anniversary book the other day, I think in New York. It's probably like a little pop-up event they usually had here, I can see. Um, obviously, you've got the cover of the book that obviously I spoke about previously. You've got a picture of the outside of the place, Big Up Zainab as well, out there stunting. Um, so yeah, they've got the, the little pop-up, I think, I guess, exhibition thing going on there. They've covered all the walls as well with all the t-shirt designs. It kind of reminds me a little bit, this little, you know, activation they've got for the Supreme book. It reminds me back in the day, Aaron Bondaroff from a New York thing, also part of like downtown New York scene. He did this, he did this thing for a book that I got somewhere. It's like a t-shirt book, My Life in T-Shirts. Aaron Bondroff did a thing, an exhibition. Let me see if I can find the picture. So Aaron Bondroff, who launched a New York thing, who used to work for Supreme, had this, had this, you know, exhibition. And I think he had this thing, I think it was called My Life in T-Shirts. And he had all, he had basically the pages of the book printed on T-Shirts. And I think he had them all hanged up in the shop as well. Let's see if I can find it. My Life, let's do this on here. My Life in T-Shirts. It was a cool little exhibition. So that Supreme thing kind of reminds me a little bit of that. Oh, I don't have it. Okay, cool. We have the book, which I have. It's, it's almost like an autobiography of Aaron Bondroff. But he also did an exhibition of it inside the store. It was like an exhibition. Let me see if I can get the bit. Maybe the, the, maybe the pictures aren't on the internet anymore. That would be annoying if true. Yeah, we don't have it. But it was, it was if I remember correctly, it was he basically had these T-shirts with all these different quotes you know, from the book or pages printed on the t-shirts and then the t-shirts were all kind of hanged up around the shop itself. So you got to kind of read the book as you were kind of going around the store. It was quite a little cool idea. So when I see this Supreme pop-up event for this book, it kind of reminds me a little bit of that, how they've got all the t-shirts printed all over the walls, like kind of wallpaper. I wonder if they'll end up selling this. I'm sure some kids would love this. If they sold this as wallpaper, I'm sure some kids would buy it or maybe they're going to sell them as posters or something, but it looks pretty cool. Obviously you've got the pictures of the, of the book itself, three volumes available there, volume one, volume two of the Supreme t-shirts, every single one designed. I wonder if they'll go as far as doing like every other piece. Will they do like outerwear as well? I wonder if they'll go and do that as well. But there's some pictures here. You've got the War Pigs t-shirt with the Black Sabbath on the back as well. Nice to see. So I think, you know what's mad? Maybe do, do they feature the front and the back of each t-shirt? That's that's a lot of fuck. No wonder it's three volumes. So this is the front. That's the back. So every T-shirt they've ever designed, if it's got a back print, you're gonna have it on a separate page. That's a lot of fucking paper. That's a lot of ink. God damn it! That must have cost an arm and a leg to print. And of course, this is everybody outside at the store events. I used to love doing these things. Not so much anymore these days. Standing outside, drinking some bevies, free drinks, whatever. I'm not sure if it's liquid. I'm not sure who they're sponsored by. I don't know what that brand is, but they're sponsored by somebody. You usually get some free drinks. You stand outside, you chit chat, look at people's trainers, judge everybody. But yeah, and there's obviously the wallpaper and the books themselves going forward. So yeah, I can't wait to see what that looks like going in. I'm definitely going to get my hands on that. One way or the other, I'm definitely going to try and get my hands on it one way or another. I do not care. I absolutely do not care. Okay. So, going forward, we want to talk about and kind of try to explain this situation that's currently going on with flipping Tremaine and Dead and Tears. Because I'm still confused as to what this whole point of it is and why this man can't seem to let go of the experience that he had over there at Supreme. So, if you don't know, 
um, Tremaine Emery from Denim Tears um, was at one point the creative director of Supreme. And then, you know, unfortunately, he had to step away from the role because from what I could deem to be, it was like a miscommunication, a breakdown in communication, a breakdown in trust, wherever it may be. And he had to obviously leave. Uh, months after, he then explained that the reason why he actually left was because he felt like the company was racist. They weren't paying attention to what he had to say. They weren't trying to put out his ideas. And essentially, he's been now on a one-man campaign to convince the world that Supreme is a racist institution. And, you know, I think the phrase he used is systemic racist. Um, so basic racism runs through Supreme, which is an odd thing to say, considering, you know, what Supreme have done over the years, the people they've kind of platformed, represented. And I guess he was mostly saying it because of the head office, because I think he said the head office didn't really reflect what the brand image was like. The brand image is very, quote unquote, multicultural and maybe very diverse, but the actual people in the office themselves aren't so much so, which is why he thinks he had an issue with them and why they had an issue with him and why he wasn't able to get his ideas out. One of his ideas, I think, was a controversial idea regarding having some sort of like slavery imagery on a T-shirt. It was actually a collaboration with this artist called Alpha Jaffa. Um, unfortunately, Supreme weren't too fond of it and they said no. And of course, that started a whole spiral of issues eventually leading to Tremaine leaving. So it seemed like he kind of got over it. He sat down with Angela back and had a really good interview. I obviously reviewed it on here and I was really um, impressed by how much he seemed to have grown and kind of got over it. He seemed to be very understanding of what happened and kind of accepting the bit of responsibility himself. And, you know, basically he wasn't, he kind of seemed like he let go of the whole like Supreme is racism is racist thing. Well, it seems like he's right back on it. Because now he's releasing these hoodies, um, which have supreme no, they have America is systemically racist all over them, which is meant to be like a nod to like an old Supreme hoodie from two thousand seven, which is a collaboration with Arthur Jaffa, and he's now got all of these um, posters, I think, plastered somewhere around New York, which is obviously a kind of flip on what Supreme do, which is also flip or lifted from the artist Barbara Kruger, which says systemic racism controls America. So this has become like his thing now, right? He's got all these, he's got all these posters plus all over the place. And it seems like it's him kind of reawakening or restarting that whole beef and that whole issue he's had with obviously with Supreme. He also released this video that features a Rubik's Cube um, covered with the same America Systemic Racism Controls America slogan on it. Let's play the video. The guy finished the Rubik's Cube and it says systemic racism controls America. Now, I just don't understand what the point of this is. Like, haven't you got over it just yet? Like, what's the actual issue here? Is this actually just an, an artistic expression that's more so akin to the work of Barbara Kruger and less to do with Supreme? Or is this another dig at his former employer because he feels like he was shafted? Because from what I can understand, from everything I've read, from everything I've listened to, I've listened to a lot of him speaking, whether it's on podcast or video, from what I've been able to see and ascertain and read between the lines is also taking into account some of my experiences that I've had in working in a corporate world and knowing how people move and whatever it may be. It just seemed to be like a breakdown in communication. It seemed to be that there was, an, there was a particular point I remember Tremaine talking about where he said um, he didn't feel like James Jebbia kind of had his back. And maybe he wasn't told beforehand that some of the projects he was working on were cancelled. They kind of like let it go until the very end, until they told him. And then at one point they kind of moved on and maybe they kind of went to somebody else to kind of get their view. And I think he, I think he also mentioned there was a, a kind of internal friction going on with that lady called Erin McGee who, who had a brand called Made Me. I'm not sure if it still exists, but allegedly Erin McGee kind of felt like she should have got the job. And I think 
Tremaine even kind of described her as maybe being racist because she didn't like him and didn't warm to him because she probably thought she was more deserving of the role um, that Tremaine got and of her being internal uh, with her being already working there because she's already worked there for like 20 years I think um, Erin McGee she probably thought oh she kind of got overlooked and that also created a bit of tension but in general just from a him point of view it just didn't feel like a good fit anyway to begin with I was I liked the I liked the hire I thought the hire of Tremaine Dare was interesting because of the work he did at Denim Tears. I thought it was a it was a forward thinking type of move, especially considering how quickly Denim Tears has grown. But when you actually deep it, when you actually kind of analyze it really, Denim Tears' mission statement has zero to do with Supreme. It would have actually made more sense if he did a collaboration with Supreme, like a little capsule collection or something, as opposed to him being the full-time creative director. That never really made any sense, especially when you consider how booming his brand is. To 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 have like a nine to five, basically, on top of running your own business is a bit much, especially when you consider his brand, you know, he doesn't really, it's not like he's doing the most challenging items in the world. It's mostly t-shirts and sweats people that actually care about. Yes, I know he has some other cut and sew pieces, but to like, it, you know, it's hard to kind of split your resources or your talents or your creative skills across those two brands. So it doesn't really make any sense to have him there in the first place. But again, at the time, it seemed a bit forward thinking. It seemed fresh, but it didn't work out. And that's perfectly okay. I just don't understand why he's trying to convince the world that Supreme is racist just because it didn't work out for him. Because it sounds like there was a breakdown in communication on both sides. So if that's the case, and maybe, you know, because it does happen sometimes, I'm not sure about you, but I know it happens. It has happened to me, luckily, but it does happen in the workplace where sometimes someone gets hired, they're in a great fit, they seem like they'd be a good fit. The interview goes well, they get hired. Then when they start working there, people start to realize, oh shit, this person actually isn't a great fit. It does happen. It can happen on either side. Maybe the the, the company says, hey, we're not a great fit. Or maybe you decide, I don't really like where I'm working at. That can happen sometimes. And I think that might happen to him, right? Maybe, you know, being a part of the Supreme team and the Supreme family from the outside was cool. But then when you get on the inside and you see how the sausage is made, no bread and shawb, suddenly you're like, mm, I'm not really a big fan of this anymore, which is understandable. But I would just like to know, if you're Tremaine and you have such a problem and you have such an issue with Supreme and it being like systemically racist and shit, just as, a, just as an observation, again, it doesn't matter this sort of stuff because I don't really care about this sort of thing. But it is an interesting question to ask. If you're like dead set on Supreme being racist and shit and then you end up marrying a very Caucasian lady, who allegedly he met at Supreme, doesn't that like throw up some questions? Especially when your brand is like very much like, I wouldn't say black power, but it's it's kind of like a black centric brand. He probably would argue against that because he happens to be a black man designing clothes. That's what it is. But he kind of leaves with race as like a selling point, which is always so funny because you got all these like pasty white kids in New York somewhere wearing that cotton reef hoodie. And that cotton reef hoodie is extreme. I wouldn't say it's racially charged, but it has racial connotations to it. So to see all these kids just wearing that cotton reef hoodie and sweats like it's just a thing, despite the, you know, the iconography and the messaging behind it being very deep rooted and being, especially in, when it comes to American slavery and stuff, it's just interesting. But that would be an interesting question to ask him. Not again, probably wouldn't answer the question. Doesn't really matter who you fuck, who gives a fuck really. But if you're going to be the rah-rah black power guy and you're going to call a brand systemically racist, you went into this alleged racist company and you end up finding the love of your life there. You end up marrying. So how racist is it really? Was she not? Was she the only not racist one there? Is James not the, is James Jebbia the racist one? Like, how far does racism go? Because allegedly other black people work there. Would they would they accuse the company of being racist? Or would they just say it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a, what you call it? It's a little bit of a hard place to maneuver because I'd imagine from the outside looking in, I'd imagine James Jebbia, who's still very much involved in Supreme, who still runs the brand day to day, probably finds it very difficult to relinquish control probably isn't good at delegating right there's probably a lot of that sort of stuff going on there's probably not a lot of like direct communication 
because people have been there for so long, things kind of get left unsaid. Maybe feelings kind of get hurt. Maybe people's responsibilities get taken away. Maybe they don't have much ownership. Maybe there's not a lot of room to grow because people don't leave the company out. For goodness sake, that Erin McGee woman, I've known her. I've known about her ever since I used to post on Hypebeast forums and she's still there. So I'm sure there's other people like her who have been there 10, 15 plus years. So you can't really progress in a company that keeps, you know, it's quite lean. It's a small operation when no one leaves. So it's hard to really kind of develop and evolve your career. So maybe it was always like that before even Tremaine even arrived there. So, you know, maybe you should do your research and kind of find out about the working environment. Maybe you don't know until you get there, but you get there. And I think part of, part of working in the corporate world is understanding how to navigate the corporate world, like quickly realizing, okay, cool. This is how they work. This is what they expect. This is what they don't expect. This is what they put up with. So don't put up with like ne negotiating and navigating that is an essential part of being successful. That's why Virgil Abloh was such a G, RIP to the great, because he was able to work with these big corporations, these big brands, um, you know, these big conglomerates and stuff while still kind of doing his own thing. But he basically was able to do the thing that Kanye couldn't do, right? Which was work with corporations and kind of, you know, be able to get his ideas off on that grand scale. And I think, to be completely honest, it's probably a more of a failure on Tremaine that he wasn't able to do that, as opposed to Supreme stifling him, silencing him, not giving him a voice. It's like, because they hired you. They hired you. They probably paid you a good salary. They gave you a prestigious position, which probably gave you a lot of clout, I'm assuming. I don't know how valuable that is, but still it kind of gave it to you. Loads of good press. Like they hired you in the first place. So how systemically racist can they be if they hire you? Were you like a token hire then? Does that does that go back to what Kanye said when he said like you were a what do you say? Like he, he I think Kanye said that to him, right? Kanye said something like he was a token black hire or something after Virgil passed. That was the next kind of person that all the brands were gonna hire to seem like they were like with the culture and shit. Like, because if you if you admit Supreme is systemic racist, then you also have to admit that you got used, that like you was like a puppet. You were basically a pawn that they use in order, you know, a, a plant, as people like to say, to kind of, you know, um, change the message or change how Supreme was viewed. Is that the case? If that's the case, that's also kind of bad. So I don't know. I look at this stuff and I'm just like, why? We don't need this. It doesn't really do or say anything. But then again, to be fair to Tremaine, this could also be more to do with the Barbara Kruger thing than Supreme. Because Barbara Kruger originally was the person known for um, that particular font that you see from Supreme in that box logo. I think it's like a Helvetica font or something. Um, and a lot of her artwork, you know, she uses words to kind of get across a message, to get across a feeling, to say something about the world that she's living in. And maybe that's what Tremaine is doing. And obviously it just happens to be he worked Supreme, so it kind of lends itself. And obviously working with Arthur Jaffa, somebody who wanted to work with me as Supreme. But I just feel... Like, it's unnecessary. Um, I wouldn't say it's tasteless. It's just unnecessary, really. And I think the guy needs to move on and just kind of, you know, let bygones be bygones. It is what it is. But let's actually check the comments. I'm curious to see what people are saying in the comments about this whole thing because it seems like a gigantic waste of time. Um, another one says, someone says here, you're not supreme. Cool message, though. Another one says, I ain't gonna lie, bruh. I seen your lady. And if that's what these clothes attract, I don't even need to be in this brand. Watermelons made me stop checking the site, but your wife is, yo, okay, this is too much. Your wife is so weak. I can't even super the, so what? You you have to, you have to want to fuck his wife to buy his clothes. What? People on the internet are bizarre. Rejected idea. Another one says, this is powerful. All the naysayers are systemic racists showing, okay, this is insane. If you don't like the idea, you're also systemically racist. Okay, I guess I am too, right? I'm systemically racist, cool. Um, another one says, that looks like a high sparrow from Game of Thrones. Make him uncomfortable. Come on, Tremaine. Need it, raw eyes. You have a white wife, someone says here. Let's see what the comments are saying here. Don't care, your wife is white. I love this, Tremaine Emery, someone says. Business is business. I like what you stand for. No one's buying a shirt with chicken or watermelon. Whoever thought this was a good idea needs to be fired. Someone says here, corny ass brand. If you buy this hoodie, you're a clown. Womp womp, someone says. Um, let's see the other stuff. Actually, let's actually go to his page 
because sometimes his page is a bit more charged than most places. Whoa, look at that. Two, look at the comments. 200, 300. Okay, cool. Let's go back. Let's go to this image and see how what the comments are saying. 262 comments. You're the worst thing to happen to Supreme. And yay, yo daddy. Bloody hell. Some white kid here. Is it? I don't know if he's white or not. You're the worst thing to happen to Supreme. Another one. Performative ass, uh, performative ass art. Bro is happily married to a white woman. Again, that shouldn't matter. That doesn't matter who he's married to. But it is interesting, just as an observation. When you are a rah-rah black guy and you're using your brand as a platform to kind of, you know, speak about race issues and to kind of forward the black message, whatever you're trying to do with the brand, who knows? Maybe he will dispute that. It's just interesting. You know, again, it doesn't matter. No one gives a fuck who you stick your dick in. It really is no one's business, but it's just an observation. And I would actually like to hear him speak about that. I'd actually like to hear him kind of, again, he probably doesn't need to. It's no one's business, but it would be interesting to hear his point. Like how you have this brand that you're always shouting to the rooftops about, especially in terms of it representing black people and shit and their struggles, especially in America. Um, with you kind of trying to tell the story of slavery in a modern way, with you trying to, you know, retell maybe some of your history through the clothes, whatever it may be, blah, 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 blah. How do you then do all that and then be a, you know, just a question. Doesn't really matter, really, but it's a question. Um, another person says, nothing says fighting systemic racism than 700 pound chicken bone necklaces. Sir, don't you mean Zionism? Another one says, I think it's interesting how you to portray your work. Most great artists know how to remove themselves from their body of work. No right or wrong about telling a story, whatever fuels the best. The haters can't help but watch and the people who love you will support naturally executed well tea. But that's, isn't that criticism at the beginning? You're almost saying what everyone is saying. He can't separate his own personal vendettas, agendas and experiences from the brand. And it's maybe damaging it, especially because people will keep viewing him as being bitter and being petty and just not be able to move on from this whole affair, even though maybe that's not the case. Another one says, and you profit from it. Did he reply to that one? No. Another one says, fire, fire. Why not spell it America KKK? Missed the opportunity there. Another one says, systemic racism, systemic racism controls America and pays your bills too. Another one says, touche. All because of Zionism and Illuminati. Clap, clap, clap. Illegal business controls America. Bro married a white woman. Thank you for making them accountable. Yet your wife works at Supreme. Yeah, that's that's the funny thing. Allegedly, that wife that he met worked at Supreme. That's the funny, that's one of the, you know, although it was a bad experience, it kind of went good because he would met love of his life. But it's an interesting place to be at, really. It's just interesting because you're doing all this stuff and you're kind of making her job hard, isn't it? How she, you know, it's kind of making her job a bit uncomfortable, you would imagine, right? Tremaine, you have yet to miss aesthetically pleasing representative of you, not just your story, but everyone that represents you. This gets me excited, works worked up and out of bed in the morning. You're getting you're you're getting excited and ready to go out of the bed in the morning because someone made a hoodie. Okay. Um, real question can they sue him for this? Generally asking, I guess who knows? My dog, it, limitation is the formest, imitation is the, is the highest form of flattery. I hate, I hate that quote because it depends who's copying you. Sometimes imitation can ruin the original work. So that's not necessarily true. Damn, that's cocky the boss. La Rage T, woo. This is absolutely hilarious. LOL, bravo. Anyway, let's see how it transpired. Let's see how it goes. Um, I find it kind of corny, kind of lame personally, just as lame as Kanye when he was doing all that tremendous stuff. I thought that was super dumb and redacted. And yeah, I won't be buying any of this shit. It's obviously not for me, but I'm sure there's people out there that will like it. I just, just like the guy to move on and kind of just do great work that he's doing with his brand. He doesn't want to move on. He still feels a little bit hard done by, and he's going to go keep on talking about this until the cows come home, innit? I guess it is what it is. I guess it is what it blood claw is. Uh, we've also got some more comments here, actually, courtesy of Stay Grounded TV. It's actually, you see these ones. Stay Grounded TV also reported on it. Let's see what they say in their comments. Um, they say here, um, I fuck with Tremaine Heavy, but Supreme isn't racist for not allowing him to put a slaves on a t-shirt. I agree with this. 
not only is that insensitive, it wouldn't want to see it on any shirt. I def wouldn't want to see under Supreme. If anything, that would be racist if they released those under the brand and profited from those designs. It's just not necessary, really, isn't it? And maybe the Supreme that was quote unquote independent. Maybe they would have done it. Maybe they would have taken that risk. But Supreme that's been bought by, what, VF Corp or whatever it may be, they're probably a bit risk averse. They don't want to get into those racial issues. They just just about managed to get through, you know, the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter riots and all that shit in America. Just about managed to squeak through that unharmed. They just don't want to bring any negative attention to themselves. So I understand why they didn't want to do it. But again, you know, I think that I think he could have done the shirt in just a cleverer way. It just didn't need to be so literal, like as he, as he was trying to do it, based on the designs. I think he kind of showed Tremaine Emery when somebody finally stops him from profiting of symbols of slavery. Angry face. We want Rob what one uh, 1970 to take over the game again. Oh, big up uh, Rob. By the way, I know him. He's the founder of a life. Big up Rob. Um, but married to a blonde woman. They say here, uh, IBCA. Someone says here, this is streetwear. Um, tremendous supreme was better though. Not rich and famous black person talking about systemic racism. <laughs> to be fair though, that's who should be talking about it. Let's be fair. If you are a rich and famous black person, you should be talking about systemic racism because that's the only way it's going to change. When rich and you know, rich people kind of talk about these sort of issues, that's when things actually change. Unfortunately, so I don't find that. I don't think that's a bad thing. Looks like a combo of the design of the Goodfellas one. Bro, all this race shit just played out. Who gives a fuck who does and doesn't like you? Nah, eh, I wouldn't go that far. It's a little bit reductive. Another one says, bro is just trying to make money off race. But that's what he does. But is that a bad thing though? Because that's what his brand is. It's just annoying because it's just like, it's the same trick every single time. But because he makes his, you know, his money off race, is that a bad thing? Like other companies make their money off one thing only. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it is what it is. Tremaine was creative director of Supreme History. They've only had one in it, so it's not that's a bit unfair. Um, yeah, I don't know about the motivation for this, but the actual messaging itself, presentation, this aside, are tough as fuck. I rock with it. He a nerd. What everyone says here, and that's it, yeah. Some people most people don't really seem to like it, it seems like. But again, will it matter? Probably not. Most people might go out and buy it. Maybe they won't. Let's wait and see how this transpires. Let's wait and see how all this transpires. Talking about Tremaine, talking about all those people, guess what's happening with Kanye West? Kanye allegedly is going to launch Yeezy Porn. This is real, by the way. This has actually been confirmed by a rep at Yeezy. Kanye is actually going to launch Yeezy Porn. So my theory that I said the other day that Kanye is really fucking horny might be true. Might be actually true. Because Kanye looks like he's going the Adam 22 route. He's going to have what? Yeezy plug. Or Yeezy talks. Come on, Kanye, man. You're better than this, yeah? Kanye West has his sights set on a new business venture. It's all about people having sex on camera. The guy's looking to prof professionally dive into porn at long last TMZ has learned. So what? Is he going to have his wife doing porn or just he's going to hire people to do porn? Is he going to be in the videos? Is he going to be narrating them? Are they all going to be wearing fucking Yeezy merch, $17 merch and stuff? Like, what the fuck is going on here? A rep for Yeezy tells TMZ, yeah, he's been kicking around the idea of launching his own pornography studio and brand for a while. And now we're told he seems dead set on doing it because he had partners are in advance talks to actually get something off the ground and running. Like, what? What happened to being a Christian? What happened to Jesus is King? Or, you know, what happened to all that? Has that all disappeared? Wasn't he moaning recently about, or not recently, but wasn't he always complaining that Kim was essentially selling her body all the time? And he said, oh, he's never going to let his, his, his daughter, you know, pose naked for a magazine, blah, 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 blah. And now he is essentially opening up a porn atelier. He's doing couture porn or something. Like, what the fuck is going on here? What is wrong with this guy, man? Damn, yay. Um, we're told that Kanye and co have been talking about building an entire porn studio, Yeezy Porn Studio, which would be a part of a broader adult entertainment <laughs> division. <laughs> adult entertainment division of Yeezy Company. In order to get it going, the reps tell us that Kanye is talking to Stormy Daniels ex-husband Mike Moles 
a vet in the porn biz. So what is he gonna is 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 Ye gonna collaborate with fucking Brazzers and shit and Naughty America, Naughty American Yeezy collab. <laughs> Pornhub, he, he's already done a Pornhub collab, right? Because Kanye designed the Pornhub Awards, didn't he? Back in the day, I don't, I'm sure some of you don't remember that one, but back in the day, Kanye did a fucking um, was it Kanye West? He did like a he was like a Pornhub creative director. I think he designed the awards and maybe some of the outfits for the for the actresses. So I think it was it was it um was it Pornhub was it Pornhub creative director? Let's see. I, th I think it was that back in the day. I remember this being a thing. So he's always been interested in porn. I guess I just thought he liked it as an artistic expression. I didn't know that he liked it, liked it, liked it to the point where he wanted to do his own studio. So yeah, Ye did um. Ye did the creative direction for Pornhub Awards back in the day. And it was a big thing. He also designed, I think, the actual award itself, I'm not mistaken. He actually also designed the awards itself. So yeah, man. He seems to he seems to really fucking like porn. He seems to be really fucking horny. Which, you know, makes a lot of sense really when you think about it. Um, it continues here. Um da da da. Like we said. Mike, oh wow, why does a uh, why does Kim kind of look like what's her face? Um Lady Gaga in this in this clip. On the cover of Bound 2, Kim kind of looks like Lady Gaga from that angle. Um, like we said, Mike knows a thing or two about porn. He's worked as a producer as well as over a decade, but even before that, he's been casting and art directing in the same industry, so he's been around the block. His credits, his credits include Arouse and Abigail and Young Fantasy 7 Vixen. <laughs> <laughs> ah, if you know those names you're a fucking sicko if you automatically record oh yeah aroused oh yeah young fantasy seven much better than fucking five it's like bro jesus in terms of when this might come to fruition we're told it might launch as early as in the summer if you follow the way yeah his career it's honestly not a surprise yeah he's been pretty open about his sexual fantasies and love of porn over the years and he's rapped about it yeah, and I know he's love. Yeah, he, he just seems to be really horny. I guess, um, kind of lame. It kind of is what it is. Again, Jesus is not king. I guess Jesus is definitely not king. Talking about Jesus not being king, have you guys seen this story? This is pretty wild, and to me, this represents why male sexual assaults and sexual abuse are not taken seriously and why there is a clear double standards because some of the memes i've been seeing online especially from like 50 cent and shit and other people online is proof that you know when somebody does something untoward towards a dude that involves something to do with sex it's definitely seen a completely different light than when it happened to a woman and what am i talking about megan the stallion has been accused of harassment by a cameraman who said he was forced to watch her have sex what does that kind of sound like it sounds like Diddy, doesn't it? The whole Diddy thing, part of the Cassie lawsuit was that Diddy allegedly would force Cassie to have sex with porn stars and shit in front of him. And he would watch or he'd walk in while stuff was happening and stuff. Which is similar to what this is, accusation is. But for some reason online, everyone's like, oh, that guy should have been happy. He should have been watching. He should have started recording. He should have got involved. People are not taking it seriously at all, which is crazy because this is kind of sick if it's true. Let's continue. A former cameraman of Megan Thee Stallion who alleges that he was trapped inside a moving vehicle with the hip-hop star in a foreign country while she had sex with a woman has filed a lawsuit accusing the entertainer of harassment and a hostile work environment. Yeah, that's kind of hostile, <laughs> right? If somebody forces you to... If, if your manager forces you to watch them fuck, that's kind of a hostile work environment. I would say that. Emilio Garcia said in a suit filed on Tuesday in Los Angeles County Supreme Court that after the alleged incident, he was, well, he was warned, don't ever discuss what you saw and berated, fat shamed and treated differently by Megan. <sighs> the harassment was so severe or pervasive that it created a hostile, abusive work environment that made Garcia's work conditions intolerable, the suit says. This is an employment claim for money with no sexual harassment claim filed and the salacious accusations to attempt to embarrass her. We will deal with this in court, an attorney for Megan Thee Stallion, Alex Spiro, said on Tuesday. Representative for Rock Nation did not rep rep uh, respond uh, for requests of comment. 
uh, Garcia, which is I think the guy here at the back there, I'm assuming with the camera, began working with Megan Stalin, whose real name is Megan Pete, as a per personal cameraman in 2018 and quit his job in 2019 to pursue a gig with Grammy winner full time and worked for her until 2023 in June. Garcia said uh, in this lawsuit that he traveled with Megan in Ibiza. Oh, this happened in Ibiza. No wonder, bro. The sun, the cat, the MD, the cocaine, the cocktails, the boats. Those are always primed for some freak shit. No wonder. Um, Garcia said in the lawsuit that he traveled with Megan to Ibiza, Spain in June 2022. And that while in the SUV, actually, let's see if we find pictures. Of, are there any pictures of Megan Thee Stallion in Ibiza in June 2022? Let's see. June 2022, Ibiza. 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 Let's see if she was there. What did she look like there? Do we see any pictures of it? Oh, we do. Wow. Okay, cool. No wonder they were up to some freak shit. She was out there on a boat, bearing skin, hair out, titties out, bum out, niash out. Oh, shit. Look at that. Party next door. Party next... Oh, sorry, party. Party some Fontaine was there. So she may have cheated on her boyfriend with this woman in a car. That's nice, isn't it? That's lovely, right? That's super nice to find out years later. <laughs> that's really nice to find out god damn man i'm getting the feeling now even though megan might have been the victim of a shooting i'm getting a feeling megan the stallion might not be a nice person i'm getting the feeling that every single time something happens the one common denominator seems to be megan the stallion maybe she isn't a good person which is weird because she might be a victim and she also might not be a decent person because she seems to have fallen out with everybody all her OG friends, she don't hang out with them anymore. The the, the 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 Tory Lanez thing is still a bit mad. People don't really talk about that too much because the whole drama started because she was fucking Tory behind her best friend's back, which is nuts in itself. Why right? it doesn't really get spoken about much because obviously you know somebody you know you getting shot is probably more important than who you fucking hook up with. But Megan Thee Stallion is a real city girl, isn't it? Like legitimate city girl. To the point where she's trying to put on shows for a cameraman and shit who might be gay. It's like, he's not interested. He just, he just wants to take pictures and hang out and shit and look cute. He doesn't want to watch you, you know, going pussy for pussy with some girl in the back seat. <laughs> it's like, it's the wrong audience, you know? It's the wrong audience, unfortunately. Let's continue here. Following the day, the rapper asked Garcia whether he was in the car with them that night before. So she didn't even remember who was in the car. She was that fucked. God damn. And when he confirmed he was him, Megan told him, don't ever discuss what you saw. This almost sounds Diddy-ish. I'm not going to lie. Are there recordings of this also? Because this almost this is giving Diddy. Garcia said in his suit that during the same trip, Megan hurled fat shaming insults at him. <laughs> oh, I don't know how I'd handle if a girl fat shamed me. I think it's one thing when your guy friends fat shame you as a dude. But if a girl was to fat shame me, I don't know how I would handle that. I might not ever recover. I might not ever recover if a girl tried to fat shame me. That's something that, you know, might throw me off course forever and ever. Um, hurling fat shaming insults at him, calling him a fat bitch and telling him to spit your food out. You don't need to be eating. Yo, Megan sounding like Lizzo out here, bro. She runs a tight ship. She wants people to spit out food, record her hooking up. God damn it. She runs a tight ship. To hear someone who advocates about loving your body tell me these things, Garcia said in the interview, I felt degraded. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. Friends say mean stuff to each other. The other stuff is mad, but, you know, the fat shaming, including that in a lawsuit, is a little bit... Uh. When they returned to the trip, Garcia said in the lawsuit his compensation structure was changed from a monthly flat rate to a pay by task system that required him to submit him for it. so she had him on salary then when he proved he couldn't be a fun guy she changed it this is the thing that's really disturbing because this kind of shows you the dangers of working in such industry sometimes the more open you are to doing freak shit the better your career will advance right but then you're also opening yourself up to abuse and harassment and exploitation 
That's the issue. If you come in there and just try and work and be professional and just do your shit and head out and go home and sleep before 10 p.m., it might actually harm your career prospects. If you're more involved and you want to get up to the fuck shit, right, and you want to party, party, party with a capital P, it might actually help you, but then you also might run into some problems. He said he was expected to provide the same services despite the patients to change, but alleges that he was treated differently following the Ibiza trip and saw a decrease in bookings Megan hired him to do. Garcia began to consider quitting the job because of Megan's possessiveness combined with a lack of appropriate pay for the amount of time he asks of him and lack of bookings, the suit said. Garcia remained on the schedule for a June 2023 job, but the night before Rock Nation notified him his services would no longer be required by Megan, according to a lawsuit. While working for Megan, Garcia enjoyed a barrage of relentless sexual and fat shaming comments, plunging him into a profound emotional distress. When I learned throughout the years is that, especially coming from a form, uh, from an office environment, is you know, there's no HR department in the entertainment business, Garcia told NBC News in an interview. So if you don't know what you're being, what you're being done wrong, you don't really know how to advocate for yourself until you start asking, maybe you start asking your peers, you have representation, they have agents, they have managers, they have attorneys. So I just really just want to encourage people to advocate for themselves. The alleged behaviour caused Garcia to face a loss of earnings in, and other unemployment benefits, as well as physical injuries, physical sickness and emotional distress, according to a lawsuit. The suit states that while working for the entertainer, he was without basic insurance coverage and therefore could not get a care he needed. Now he grapples with mounting anxiety, depression, physical distress stemming from a toxic work environment. Oof, Megan's going to have to settle out of court for this one, isn't it? She's going to have to settle out of court for this one. Megan just needs to pay our client what he's due. Own up to her behavior and quit this sort of sexual harassment and fat shaming, said Ron Zambrano, the attorney of Garcia, said in a statement to NBC News. Emilia should never have been put in a position of having to be the vehicle with her while she had sex with another woman. Inappropriate is putting it lightly. Exposing this behavior to employees is definitely illegal. Can you imagine if that was a guy did that to a woman? How the timeline would blow up. But because it's an attractive woman doing it to a guy, everyone is just like laughing and kind of mocking the guy and telling him that he should have joined in and shit. It's like, what? Can you imagine if this was like, can you imagine if it was the other way around, how this would have looked? God damn it, bro. Garcia also outlines alleged employment and wage violations that sent on classification as an independent contractor. The lawsuit alleges that Megan prohibited him from working for anyone else and was denied overtime payment. See, that's that's a scummy shit. I understand if you don't trust the guy anymore because he seemed a bit uncomfortable when you're hooking up with a girl and you stop giving him bookings. Okay, it's a bit fucked up, but okay. But then denying him the opportunity to go and work in other places or for other people is really, really scummy. You know? Really, really scummy. Um, his misclassification as independent left him without basic insurance coverage and depriving him of central health care. Garcia told NBC News in an interview that he is seeking more than six figures. The suit seeks unpaid wages as well as interest on unpaid wages, unpaid overtime wages and other employee benefits at a legal rate. He's also seeking statutory penalties and wage penalties um, pursuant to California labor laws, punitive damage according to the proof and costs he incurred, including attorney's fees. I wonder if this will have anything anything to do with the Tory Lanez case. I wonder if she admits the fault in this, if the Tory Lanez lawyers would be like, you see, this girl's a fucking liability. She's a mess. Because she seems to be, you know, a little bit of a mess, a little bit chaotic. Maybe they might use this to their advantage or something. But either way, um, she seems to be a bit of a problem, isn't it? This lady seems to be a bit of a problem. She seems to be a bit of a problem. And it's just wild to see the timeline not really give a fuck that a guy had been, you know, subjected to this. When if the tables were turned, people would have definitely been rioting on the streets. But I guess it is what it is. I guess it is what it is. So as a way to end the show, I want to look over the fucking Kanye interview with Justin Leboy. I've seen some bits and pieces here and there, but I want to watch it and react to it myself here on the flipping pod. So let's see what Kanye had to say when he sat down with Justin Leboy. Um, I still can't understand this friendship. I really don't get it. 
Um, Ye has really weird taste in friends in general. It seems like um, it doesn't ever make sense who he's friends with, who he kind of lets into his inner circle. Um, and I guess Justin the Boy is one and another one. He seems very annoying. He seems very corny, very lame. His social media page that everyone kind of likes is fucking garbage, right? Um, the me, like, it's just, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just don't see what, I'm surprised they're friends. You know, that's the thing I'm thinking. I'm just, I'm just surprised they're friends. That's it really, to be completely honest. But anyway, he did an interview with Ye. They sat down together. Annoyingly, this interview was behind a paywall. You had to buy something from Yeezy.com. Then you got sent a link. It's like, bro, this isn't the, this isn't the Ye that I remember. You have to pay for his interview. Like, what the fuck? Like, Anyway, whatever. Let's see. Let's let's hear what he has to say about everything that's been going on. Just the boy, the king of toxic himself. I'm back, man. I'm feeling good. Y'all know when y'all see me, it's a fucking problem. You know what I'm saying? Y'all cool. thought I wasn't gonna ever come back, speak. It's my first fucking episode. I got my brother with me, co-hosting. This ain't no interview. We ain't asking him shit. We talking about child. Y'all know when y'all see us together, it gets scary. <laughs> it's a scary moment. Really dope. What up? We here, Chicago. We here. What's up? Yeah, I don't even got to introduce you. We're not even going to do all this shit. We're just going to get straight into it. The hottest shit in the world right now. <sighs> Let's jump right in. We saw you and your wife out at Disney. Next, we see reports of a battle. By the way, adults that continually go to Disneyland kind of deserve whatever happens to them, innit? If you're not a fat white woman... Or if you don't have kids, what the fuck are you doing at Disney just on your own as a grown adult? What is wrong with you? And I love Ye, but what is wrong with you? To recharge as a result of your wife being sexually assaulted. Wifey okay? What happened? How important is it for you to protect your loved ones? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's just... Uh... What's the question you want? How important it is, or what happened? Now, what happened? What's the what's the story? He didn't. He he still has. He I, uh, who did he punch anyway? Was it like a white kid or something? Because you know, Ye likes to pick and choose who he gets physical with. <laughs> who did he actually punch? Sorry, because you got security and you a shot tell nigga. Yeah, it's like my wife is walking to the bathroom at the chateau, and then chateau maman. The, this guy. So this wasn't at Disney. I think everybody think this happened at Disney. Yeah. Oh well, well let's not let's not kill the magic. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this happened better. at Disney. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, let's um, well, we don't have to make it as specific then. Yeah. yeah, yeah we'll no, say, for sure. you know, this this guy just grabbed my wife, and then she just, I didn't see it directly, and she started just explaining to me what happened so then i walked over and found him and then i'm talking to security different security like not not just the security that be with me but other security like okay let's get this guy just escorted out or something you know it's like <laughs> look man I, of, of course yeah he's that kind of guy isn't it of course he's that kind of guy what's that is that a fire? Long as it's a fire alarm. Come on. Before I nearly had to kind of go down for a fire test there, but we're back. All we're all good. All good. All good. False alarm. I just don't want to. Um, and I talked to the guy. I said, yo, I need you to just, you just need to leave right now. He's like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It'd be, it's like, no, it's not okay. <laughs> it wasn't okay. Then, then he saw it wasn't okay. He had to go to bed early, tuck this nigga in. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so is he, he might still be asleep mm -hmm. then. Yeah. Shot town. I can't. I don't know what happened. <laughs> he still. He just sleep though. He had to go to bed early. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Mm -hmm. We gonna take it mm -hmm. over to this rap beef, man. This is the most entertaining rap beef in a few years. You got Future, Metro, Drake, Kendrick, yeah. J Cole, Ross. Chris Brown, Quavo, The Weeknd. Yeah. What The Weeknd doing? What happened? I mean, Drake and his people taking shots at The Weeknd. They not really feeling how uh, he's fucking with Metro. You know what I'm saying? Because they all from Canada. Yeah. Um, I feel like you started this shit, though. It all started from, I feel like, your Instagram post when you was just like, fuck everybody. And everybody's like, you know what? It's up. We all just mm -hmm. going at each other. We tired yeah. of all the friendly shit. Uh, What's your thoughts on the state of 
hip hop right now? It's great. It's great for me, you know. <laughs> like I'm always on that time. You know, sometimes I, you know, you see, I put the Instagram up. I there's nobody finna play with me. I I done been through too much of this shit. I done made more money than anybody ever make at this shit. Had more <laughs> like hits. Made my own Jordan. Fucked every bitch. Like so, it's. Like I don't, I don't care. I invented, like I said, I invented every style and shit. So it's shit. Yay's too grown. Gay has too many kids to be talking like this, man. It's just a bit. Oh. All right, I guess, isn't it? Like, he's really trying to insert himself into his beef. It's nothing to do with him as well. But anyway, whatever, whatever, whatever. This shit fun to me, you know. But I'm, I'm really into the idea. You know, it's with Drake. That's the whole thing. It's like morality and likability are not uh, not connected. They're usually the opposite. Right. Usually the most immoral people are the ones that are the most likable. So if I say, what? I like Drake, it's not because he's a good person. It's because I like him. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> what? I like, I like, I got like for everybody. You know, I'm not going to say love because you got the love. That, that's going to weaken you. That compromises you. So I got right. like for everyone. Right. And it's just I think this is a beautiful time. You know, it's like we saving a world like you take Drake and Lucy and out. That just alters everything because that's such a control thing. They had the algorithm, the way that they work together to fix the numbers and all that. You know, uh, they that they, they have to working together. Absolutely. I guess we're going to name this nigga after a dragon, some demonic shit like Drake yeah. and all this type of shit. Like we're going to change your name, actor, and do this. Because it's like, <laughs> you know. I love how much he loves. I love how much he hates Drake. I love it. It's just so unhinged. It's like maybe Drake does some stuff to him behind the scenes. Maybe it's the rumors about Drake allegedly fucking Kim. But it just seems so one-sided. The hate levels. I'm sure Drake probably hates Kanye too, but the intensity, the ferocity of the hate on Kanye's side is interesting because he really despises that guy, like really to his core. And it seems like he just despises him because he's more popular <laughs> currently. Not because he's a better artist because he's not. Not because he's a better musician because he's not. Not because he has more hits than him because he doesn't. He just hates him because he's popular. Because the truth is, if Drake wasn't around and Ye was still doing what Ye does, he'd be the most, you know, talked about person still in hip hop. But because Drake is around, he kind of takes all the attention away. And one thing Ye doesn't like is people not paying attention to him. Hence why he just inserted himself into his beef when no one spoke, when no one said his name. You know, in a heart of hearts, like whether it's like Tubbs and this and that, all the Canada, they love Ye and yeah. shit. And, I, and I'm... I'm invincible. Like, even if I died, I wouldn't die and shit. I'm <laughs> right. like, so... I love when he says this sort of stuff. It's almost like he's trying to goad people into doing something. He always mentions this, oh, if I die, if I die. Like, bro, no one's going to touch you. Do you know what I mean? You're not anywhere. You you know, you live in wherever you live. Like, you know what I mean? No one's... no one's. You don't have ops that are going to run you down and stuff. Like, stop bringing that kind of energy, man. Come on, yo. And as I'm tired of this nigga fucking with me and all this shit, man. So the fact that these niggas is coming together finally, because it's not just about the finally. elimination of Drake, you know, it's like. Right. You know how intense that is? The elimination of Drake. Like, really? Because he gets more number ones, because kids seem to like him more and he's more current. You want to eliminate the guy. Like, it's a bit intense. But as a fan of music, it's definitely going to bring us the best music because for sure. Drake's going to have a couple of bars for him. That's going to make Kanye angry. He's going to go in the booth. He's going to have a couple of bars and they're going to go back. So we're going to get great entertainment and music for it, from it. But it's just wild to hear him say, I want to eliminate Drake. It's like, wh what did he do? Did he father one of your children? Like, by, see, like, like eliminate? What did it, like that? And, and that's the other thing too. No one's saying what their problem is. And the fact that no one's saying what their problem is, my assumption is this. There is no problem. They just don't like the guy. <laughs> Which is hilarious, right? There is no real beef. They just don't like that he's number one and that he's omnipresent and he doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. It's like, what, a 15-year run has been like, it feels like so far, and he's not slowing down. Every Spotify rap that comes out, 
he's fucking number one. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, oh. Like, we're going to tear the head off whoever they got that they thought was in control of all this shit. Like, look at this. It's like, they running the numbers. They running on radio. They got the smash. And then, you know, it's like, now they not playing Lil Wayne no more because he ain't, um, you know, he's not directly connected with Lucy. And then they go right. and, like, buy the cash money shit out. Then they, like, pick and choose who they want. Oh, we're going to have Migos one week, and then we're going to have... Um, future, this thing we had two chains, this that, and they always pick somebody. <laughs> oh, now we gotta have twenty one Savage. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's like they always pick somebody from Atlanta. I'm from Atlanta. I was born in Atlanta. Right. Whatever. You know. How did so, that even happen though? Like, yeah. I mean, before we even get into what happened, who is Lucian Grange? Like, who is he? Because people don't know who he is, and I feel like you have to he's be just, higher up to know exactly who he is, and you've got to that level. He's still higher. He's still a higher gun. He's just like a like a nigga handler. Like he just control. <laughs> Like, nigga handler is hilarious. Uh, universal. He run it for him, but he nigga ain't handler. Like, he ain't no overboss or nothing okay, like so that. He, he not no, like he not no billionaire nigga like yay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> he no yeah, but like, he got fucking no. Justin Leboy, fucking hell, man. Justin Lecuck, Justin Lasaki. What the fuck is wrong with this guy? Cringe. You know what I'm saying? His money is like infinite. It's just a, it's a form of energy. It's a tool and shit. You know, right. it's like. But he is someone who, in the he's like light skin academics, isn't it? Justin the boy, he's like light skin academics. This this is like this is like if academics was to interview Drake, it'd be just as nauseating. If academics sat down and interviewed Drake, it'd be just as nauseating. It'd be like giggling, <laughs> like fucking hell, man, yuck. The constructs of where. Uh, where niggas have been placed, you know, Native Americans, all the combination. Because my grandmother's Indian, like, right. you know what I'm saying? They don't put that in the schools <laughs> that they end Kanye is everything. I was born in Atlanta. My grandmother's Indian. My dad was an astronaut. Like, Kanye is hilarious. <laughs> you know, I invented, <laughs> you're probably going to say, you know, I I invented windmills, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I invented the combustion engine. Yo, fucking yeah, he's a legend. Doctrinate oh. us into because you know you chief, then you know you chief. They ain't gonna teach you that you chief. They gonna like give you a contract, rap contract, basketball contract. Say you king, but you only king to a certain limit. Mm. As long as you don't get out of line, okay, you king type shit. So no, for sure. I mean, obviously, <laughs> Kendrick. Mm. Dropped the like that verse. Drake dropped the push ups just a minute ago. He put it on all DSP, so he's really yeah. standing on his disc. Yeah. Have you heard both of them? Yes, I heard it. What do you think Kendrick's gonna do now? Do you think he got some shit for Drake? Who do you think wins that? I battle? win. I got some shit for Drake, and don't nobody want it with me. <laughs> Hold up, what you mean you got some shit for Drake? That's a, you got of some course. Shit for Drake? It's all like right now, like you got some shit ready for Drake. I Until we listen to the shit you got. I Drake? shit on him. Fuck him. Like I told you, I I I, I put the shit in. And I said, "Fuck this nigga." Is fuck this nigga, and I like him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it's like <laughs> it, it's 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 always like he's so confusing to be friends with. That's probably why Drake did that bar in it and that record. Was he saying that record? He's got that record. What what, what tune is it again? Where he says, "Oh, he thought he'd be cool." Then it wasn't cool anymore. He must be hard person to be friends with because he legitimately is bipolar in that respect. Like you don't know what version of yeah you're gonna get. You don't know if you're cool, if you're not cool. But in general, there's probably some deep rooted reason why these guys don't get along. It's 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 probably deeper than rap. We probably will never find out, but there's definitely some deep deep reason why this is the case. Um, what 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 record it is? I, I think it might be story. Is it story about my brother? Maybe it's that one. Is it a story about my brother? Decompress, people that are heavy, definitely shoot permission, whipping it. I don't think it's that. Is it that one or is it the other one? Or is it Red red Button? Maybe it's Red Button. But one of them, he says basically he fought him and Ye were fine. Then the next day you see him dissing online type of thing. So it's like, yeah, it's all over the place, isn't it? You don't really know what version of Ye you're going to get. Yeah, this is one. Every time you need... Yeah, so this is one. Um, that These are the bars that might be pointed at yay which they probably are on red button it says uh 
Man, all this luggage in the lobby like I'm getting traded. Every time you need need me for a boost, I never hesitated. Every time that Yeezy called a truce, he had my head inflated. Basically meaning he was happy. Um, thinking we're going to finally piece it up and get to levitating. Realise that everything premeditated. Everyone was good with me. Then everyone expression faded. So maybe this has been an ongoing thing. And just one time, Drake was like, you know what? Enough's enough. I'm not going back and forth with you. We're not going to be friends anymore. Let's just end it. Who knows? Or maybe Ye did it on his side. Who knows? Fuck this nigga. The little slick shit he be doing. Fuck all that. And that's what it is. But I did. What's the slick shit? Say it. Please let us know. I'm curious to know. What is this slick shit? I would love to know what the slick shit is that Drake keeps doing because clearly he's doing something. This guy can't just be getting wound up by himself. What is the slick shit? Please tell us. Do this uh like that remix though. I think that's what you was wanting to lead oh, into shit. and shit. Let me see. You got the mm. like that remix. I don't believe Gay jumped on the like that remix. You know we had to get the hooligans up here. We're gonna take this pussy nigga out. Yo, dad, I got you. Horrible verse, by the way. I don't I don't really care. Let's take it. I don't give a shit. It's God, you heard it here first on the download. Damn, yeah. I think I think I think this guy is cornier than academics. I'm not gonna lie. I think this guy is lamer than academics. Even academics wouldn't do this with Drake. His facial expressions, the way he speaks, like bozo, bro, bozo. What yeah, yeah, hold on, hold on. How, how did this even come about? Who called who? I, I need the story behind this. This shit is crazy. He's 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 like a walking he's like a he's like a walking where's my hug at? That's what he is. A walking where's my hug at? Crazy. Oh uh, yeah, Pluto. Pluto wow. called me. I went to the studio, laid that, and then we um, you know, went through the so future you know, the creative process. So future is definitely not fucking with Drake. Future's the one that called Yay Jesus and the chords and called the hooligans. Called him out in London to get on a joint. You know, everybody was very, very excited about the elimination of Drake. Yo. <laughs> we were not excited, we was energized. I mean, listen, <laughs> man, <laughs> it's, it's a lot to take in. Because, like you said, you like people. You and Drake mm. was neighbors once upon a time. Yeah, not, that again. wasn't my choice. Okay. Oh. <laughs> 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 that was yeah, my choice. Yeah, was friends. He was your little bro at, at, at one point. Yeah, yeah, was. I'm just as need, far as I seen from the outside looking in. I need a massage somewhere <laughs> on my neck. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Did the Hoover come? At least he's being honest now. At least he's letting it be known. Now nah, I never fucked with that guy. Whatever truce we had was like temporary. He's not my guy at all. Never fucked with him. By the way, I hate that the download sign. Is like backwards. On the corner, it's like the bar is going one way, and on the banner on the top, it's going another way. Whatever, it doesn't matter, but I hate it. Let's get together. Me and the rest of the world thought y'all were back cool. What happened after that? Like, what happened after that to where y'all didn't? Because I thought once that Thank concert you. happened. Please say, yeah. It cuts Drake's soul. It's like he signed a, uh, his soul to the devil to not be cool with me, to have to, like, this is his job to go against God. Oh, you see? Explain. Uh, come on, yay, man. The guy asked you, a, uh, for once, he actually asked you a good question. What happened after the fucking Free Hoover thing? What happened after the hostage video where he's with fucking, um, what's his name? Jay Prince apologizing and shit. What happened after that? Where, why did it go from that? Where they were both like hugging and taking turns to perform and at shit at that free Larry Hoover concert shit. What happened? He's designed by God. It's like, come on, yay, man. Wow. Wow. And it cuts his soul what? his soul to the devil to not be cool with me, to have to like this is his job to go against God. Wow. Wow. And it cuts his soul. But what is it? specifically about thank you drake that everyone hates I, I, just, I just have to know that because it's like for everybody all of the great you weekend pluto metro ross kendrick. like kendrick yeah. like there's something obviously wrong with this one individual that no one wants to speak about and i feel like you're the only person that's gonna yeah. really put it out there i say rich baby daddy it's like 
Drake has a rich baby daddy named Lucian and Universal. So what? Are they all jealous that Lucian Grange isn't in their good graces or something? It is all it is. Just jealousy that they're not number one. It's not that he fucked Kim. It's not that he might have fucked Kendall or Kylie or Chris Jenner or Caitlyn Jenner. It's not having to do with that. It's just because he's pally pally with the Universal guy. Is that is that the beef they all have with him? Bloody hell, man. The music industry is... But maybe it, maybe it makes sense, though, in some respects. Because let's say it's true that Drake has favourable splits. Because that's what happens, right? If you're the number one guy, you get to negotiate a different, different splits for yourself. Because you could argue, if you're Drake, hey, I'm the one that brings the most eyes and ears to a platform like Spotify or Apple Music. So you could get prefer you could get um you could get um different splits than what other artists get because you're the biggest star out there so when other artists find out that you're getting way better percentages way better returns maybe whatever it may be it, it's gonna annoy them right because they're not getting compensated for their art the same way you are so that's the only reason why they hate him nothing else nothing personal hmm Wow. He's like, you know, like, man, my daddy got it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, wow. my daddy controlled the spins. My daddy got the DSPs. My daddy, Drake wow. has a rich baby daddy named so, Lucian. So all of his streams <laughs> and the number ones is controlled by someone named Lucian. Well, Lucian work for people who control the banks in Africa who keep, you know. Oh my God. Think the banks in Africa are making Drake number one is fucking hilarious. But we, had, download. we had Black Wall Street, we had Harlem, we've been gingified and we ain't really been pulled together since other than to maintain what they call the black vote, which you ain't really, you don't have an opinion in that vote. And then they get all these celebrities, they go on TV like, ah, you know, we, uh, we got a problem with his political opinion. He's out of control. He's bipolar. He's anti anti-Semite, he's whatever they want to call somebody to try to get people to not listen or have, you know, take away the influence. But look, it's just, I'm God, you know what I'm saying? Wow. I'm, I'm back here again. I'm letting y'all know what shit. it is. It's like, it's not, it ain't even shit. It's like, this is what it is. I'm, I'm, I've returned, you know? <laughs> yeah. There you have it. Ye is the GOAT. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, Just change the AT to a D. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> He's God. You on your real God level shit, you stand on it. So how yeah. you feel when people like Ross get involved in this shit? Like, do you, have you been keeping up with that part or are you just on some shit like, I'm God? You know what I said? The like and love, it's like, I actually, I would say I, I love Ross. There's certain people I like and certain people I love. I understand that says that's, you know, sort of, you know, Ross... You know, at that point, I've, I've extended that level of a branch to say, like, man, I really got love for Ross. And it's like, you know, I, I don't, I haven't been keeping up like that. I was, they, they, they call me, you know, I'm sitting mm. up there, sitting in heaven and shit. And then they, they say, God, come, <laughs> God, come, uh, come hop on this and shit. And it's like, here we go. The voice of God. <laughs> yeah, no. Nah, how, 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 how does that make you feel though? Like knowing, cringe. You're that great because you had Carnival that was number one. Mm -hmm. and then the next number one after that, then they call you to be a part of what I believe is gonna be another number one. Does that make you? Yeah, it it, it feels good. You know, I had to come. You know, I have to come. I had to come and do my job. Right when I heard, it, I was like, Yo, Kendrick shifted the energy. You know what I mean? Like, we brought out Vultures as number one, Carnival's number one. It was like it was our birthday every day. Yeah. Then they, they had this, like, Metro, what he did with the beat. You know how I you know, feel about Pluto, most influential. Yeah, yeah. And then you got Kendrick on it, too. Like, like people hit me like, listen to this right here. And I was like, okay, they shifted the energy. It's like, we had to get get to work. Yeah. So I'm up here working, and I just get, like, the, the back call or the, like, <laughs> like, yo, get on. It's like, where? It's like, it's up. You know, life is like life is made for me to win. You no, know? nah, man, we 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 love mm -hmm. that. But you know, before we change um, subjects, J Cole apologized to Kendrick. Fuck all that pussy shit. Oh shit! Fuck all that shit. Yeah, you have it. Yo, fuck all that shit, man. Because it's like that nigga J Cole went on tour Drake. He know what it is. It's like nigga, you can't run now. It's you also all this like. It's up for it's up for Cole too. 
if you say cold, you can't say up and cold in the same sentence. Oh it's like, it's God. Like, it's, <laughs> That's funny. He's got the same smoke for Cole. But this, this has been long. This has been a long time coming. Cole's been, you know, firing shots at Ye for a while. So I don't blame him for saying this. Are right. apologies even allowed in rap beef though? I don't know. I've man. never seen no shit like I that just before. Don't, I don't. I don't listen to J Cole, so I wouldn't even know. I just heard he had a song called "False Idols" and told me. Somebody told me it's halfway about me, so it's like that. You know. Wow. There, there you got it, man. Yeah. When we talk about music, we are gonna always talk about the goat. Ye's the goat. I mean, mm. the only one who got the raps, the production, just just everything that embodies this shit. The man. money, the taste. Oh, the money. Yo, why Yo. nobody, hold on, hold on. Why nobody ever beefed about, like, Ross and Drake arguing about money in houses. Why nobody ever came at you about money? Because I made the most and we're going to make the most again. You know, that's what it is. <laughs> it's like, like everybody dude, leave Ye alone when it come yeah. to money. What? And then it's like, I got my mind. They try to throw me out of my mind. They try to medicate me. They tried to, they really tried to physically take me off of this planet and I'm, I'm here. Like, you got the... All that bipolar and the medication and turning me fat and all the reputation shit. That's like so the bipolar thing is is a is made up. He doesn't believe he's bipolar. Doesn't believe in medication. Blames people for making him fat. <laughs> isn't that just like a? Isn't the fat thing a a, a side effect of bipolar medica medication anyway? <laughs> He's he he loves being a victim, innit? I love Ye, but he's he's a little bit of a victim, innit? He loves being a fucking victim. <laughs> like Tupac shot up in the elevator, so now nah, healthy right now it, too, though. Exactly, I yeah. exactly. I'm, no, it's you in shape, nigga. Yeah, it's yeah. up, man. We gonna move on to. The did he did he just look him up and down like he wanted to fuck him or something? This guy is. What is wrong with this kid, bro? No wonder Ye keeps him around, doesn't it? He like sucks him off. Nah, Looking healthy right now too, though. Exactly. I know. Yeah. Exactly. I'm, no, it's you in shape, nigga. Fucking yeah, hell, man. Man, we gonna move on to the it's next disgusting, subject. Disgusting, bro. This is the download. Who ra who's raising these niggas? Who's raising? Did, did this guy not have a father or some sort of father figure? Why are you up here looking looking up another man saying him he looks in shape? Why go on for that? Look at shape, nigga. If Bianca wasn't here, I'd take you in the back room, my nigga. It's like, what? What? That's my co-host today. The greatest living artist, the greatest living human. Yeah, you niggas cannot afford him to even do anything. It's my brother, though. He pulled up. <laughs> we, we we moving on now. We got the mm -hmm. NBA. We got gambling. Ye doesn't really watch much TV, but we're going to run this by him. There's a Toronto Raptor player named John Tay Porter. He received a lifetime ban from the NBA for violating gambling rules. Is it hypocrisy that the NBA promotes gambling through platforms like prize picks and fan duels, but a ban a nigga for trying to get his money up while he's on an NBA minimum contract? Imagine you get banned for life. Fuck the NBA. Mm. There you have it. Hey, you know my feelings about that. They just controlling niggas. They like, you know, uh, like the house in the hood where you learn to play basketball, the same people that own that house own the house that you get if you make it to the NBA. Mm. Let you get out of line, they're going to send you back to that <laughs> old house. But if you while you're in line, they're like, oh, you could buy a house for your mom, you could buy a house for your family. And most people, most people going to stay in, in line on that. They, you know, they control by the, the money mm -hmm. on that. You know, that's what it is. Okay. NBA is cool. You know, I'm happy to been able to see Michael Jordan when I was growing up and that was inspiring up to a certain level but yeah. okay yeah there you have it yeah he says fuck the NBA I remember seeing Kobe at a ski resort after I made new slaves and he said that's all we are is high price slaves wow you know what I'm saying but a place, placebos and nocebos you, you you what a man think he is so you know we not the slaves we we are the kingdom and mm -hmm. I'm the head of the kingdom yeah, how does what? it feel to be the head of the kingdom? It always felt good, <laughs> but you know, just to like plant your feet there and know that we run this shit and Lucy and This is sad, man, because Kanye interviews used to be like showstoppers and I'm already getting bored. Kanye interviews used to be so important. They used to be so important. Like 
you'd kind of stop what you were doing. You'd listen to him in the background when you were in class or you try and sneak out and listen to him in the toilet. Like Kanye interviews, Kanye mid convert, min, min, mid concert rants would get clipped and uploaded onto YouTube and run up millions of views. This interview is like all over the place. I don't know if he's okay, if he's not okay. He's going on different tangents. He's not answering questions. He's answering some questions. Like. <sighs> don't run this shit. And it's the same spirit of, of Mike and Prince, Kendrick. Like, this the spirit. This this what we on. You know, this is what we on. You know, this is what I'm on. Period. Ain't nobody scared of nothing. We done been through everything. And that's it. Nobody better play with me. Like, mm. for instance, Dirk sent in a, a verse and it said, he said, take my Yeezy shirt off and make it a dome mat. And he Lil said Dirk. it four times. Yeah, Lil Dirk said this. I hit him up. I said, you know, you're breaking my heart. Wow. Who told you to do this? I'm like, wow. I, don't, I don't know if it's a legal thing that happened. And I'm trying to sit with the man. I'm like, man, this is bad for the city. Who told you to do this, bro? It's wow. just like when J. Cole did the diss track or whatever. It's like, it's one thing, you got Drake. It's like, he's really paid to come and and do whatever he does and shit come on my neck, all this type of shit. Right. But it's another thing for somebody like that to come around you. When did Drake come out his neck though, recently? I'm, I'm confused about this. And also the Dirk thing. So Dirk had a line to take off my Yeezys and what? Like... So what did Dirk say when he messaged him? It's like why you that's all the whole friends enemy kind of talk and shit like But Dirk was on vultures though. Yeah, and but he was rocking what you say so you're telling me he really not rocking with you? He must have never really liked me or whatever. I don't know exactly what it is, but I, I spoke to this man a few times about, you know, the line. Then he changed the line. Then he changed the line to I take my Yeezy hat off and give my little hoe that. And I'm just like why y'all think y'all could play with me? See, they think I'm like, oh, this he's going to get hyped up. Let's watch him. Like, my, people try to, like, take your kids and, you know, give you a rap bar, yeah. say some lines. Yo, it's like, what? Are you disappointed in Dirk? Honestly, like, let, let's let's be real. Like, you my brother. Are you disappointed in Dirk? Oh, fucking no. Justin boy, man. Keep your fucking tongue in your mouth, bro. He has a wife. I'm not disappointed. It's like, man, niggas is like, yo, y'all should meet up. Blah, blah, blah. I don't really listen to that much rap. No way. I don't know nobody. No fuck. I don't know nobody fucking raps, man. I don't even know my own raps. I fucking put a mask on. I ain't grab a microphone. I don't. I don't. I don't listen to that shit, man. Yeah. Period. I don't listen to nothing, man. I'm just God. Period. That's what you want. You stand on that. Cause you have to feel it. You know. Obviously, we spoke about Drake earlier. Dirk. Went from vultures to on tour with Drake. You ain't, you didn't feel no way about Dirk. I mean, you could be like, we could be vulnerable with each other. That shit was heartbreaking to you, bro. No, it didn't break my. I ain't had enough heart into it for it to break my heart. It wasn't wow. that. It wasn't that much. Of it. But it didn't break my heart. But when they sent in over these verses and saying like, I cut my Yeezy. I can't even like. I want to say. It was unbelievable, but at this point, you know, <laughs> any and everything is possible. I really don't understand why he thinks that's a diss. So he gets Dirk to do a verse for him. Dirk sends it back and it says, I cut off my Yeezys to make a dot Like what? Because it's technically him walking on a doormat, which is kind of like saying he's trampling on Yeezys. Why does he see that as a diss? Then he confronts him. And what does Dirk say? Does he agree as a diss? Does he not agree? He re-recorded the verse allegedly, and sent another one in that said, "I gave my ho I, I cut off my Yeezys and gave my make my hoe wear it or something." I, I'm still confused. I don't get this issue with that. Like, what it doesn't make sense? Anything and everything is possible. So it's whatever, man. You know. Right. Okay. So my <laughs> next question is: Are industry plants really a thing? Because we hear about Illuminati, industry plants. Are industry plants really a thing? And yeah. if so, can you give me an example? Because you be talking about people that are plants. I need you to really describe what an industry plant is and who's like the head of the industry plants. 
I don't really know who that they they never let me in on. It's like people do cocaine, they go to the bathroom, they don't they don't bite me because I don't do cocaine and shit, you know. So all the and it, Can you imagine how annoying and how manic Ye would be if he was on Coke? He's already like this somewhat sober. Can you imagine what he'd be like on Coke? How unbearable he'd be. How long of a rant he'd go on. It's like they probably see like, oh, this nigga got the spirit of his dad. This he he not gonna be controlled or moved by money. It's like when people go to the league, it's uh it's um if you if your dad is too far in your life and I know they promote the Steph Curry shit, but yeah, yeah. they don't pick people whose fathers are too much in their life, you know, mm-hmm. because they're less controllable. Because Absolutely. the thing about a, a woman is a caretaker, so they're gonna be like um, more uh, controlled by the idea of having the food on their plate now. Yeah. So if you do the welfare system, take the fathers out their home, and then give welfare, especially if you got five kids in the home. Now the welfare is in control. Mm. Now Instagram is in control. Now wow. TikTok is in control. Now Reddit is in control. Now Snapchat is in control. <laughs> wow. Now just the idea of likes and all that is, it has a certain amount of control. Right. And you get the kings and the chiefs and all that. You try to tear down a reputation. You try to come and take them, lock them up. Anybody who ain't play by the rules or play by the, the game or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. And when you say you wasn't invited to these parties, obviously Cat Williams and talked about these parties. People are mentioning... I don't know if it's a party. I'm saying that yeah. metaphorically, you know what I'm saying? But but you've heard about the parties that everyone is talking about, but you've never got invited to them. So you I don't know what really... part. I don't know. I don't even know what the party... That's how far out of it I am. I don't know, but the people call me Illuminati too. It's like, call me what? Okay, cool. I'm Illuminati. Whatever it is. It's like, <laughs> whatever the fuck, I don't care. I really yeah. don't give a... F- yeah, I yeah. really don't give a fuck. There you have it. What made you drop vultures during that time specifically? And what was it about the whole situation? Because listen, you can say what you want, but I know there's a reason why you did that when you did it. Can we speak about that today? Fate. Mm. Astrology. No, not fate, but astrology. That was a good date. It's like the you can't deny it. You just can't deny astrology. People go <laughs> give you like all these dates for whatever. Oh no, Ye's into astrology as well. Oh, couldn't get worse, man. There's if there's one thing that will send me to sleep, if there's one thing that will make me want to hurl myself out of a window, it's people that get extremely attached or dialed in on astrology and start to talk about you based on your sign. Oh, you're this or you do. It's like what? What? Because of what? Oh yeah, that's how they are. Because they're like this. Is that, like, what? Nah. Ye's going outside. Ye believes in fucking astrology. No, thank you. No, thank you. For religion, they want to shove on us and shit like that. But you just can't just just follow the dates. When God shit come, God, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, especially because it ain't one no no label where they could turn it down no more. They've been turn. They've been trying to turn it down since Taylor Swift. Right. You know, that's why I say since Taylor Swift, since I had the Rolly on the wrist, on the new Jesus, bitch, I turned water to Chris. This mm. for what they did to Chris. They can't do shit with this. Wow. Because Chris, Chris is a god. You know, that's uh, I mean, Who's look Chris? at Chris Brown. Oh, okay. Yeah. Look for what they did to Chris. That's what, what I mean. Yeah. You, you think you think we're gonna ever what they did to Chris or what Chris did to himself? Just you. We we could be honest. Is one of your goals to perform at the Super Bowl halftime at any point? Obviously, if I own, you're not like, if I nice enough to be like considered, but is that like a childhood goal of yours to yeah, perform? Yeah, but who sets the goals? Who says you want to be like Christ or like Mike? Who sets those goals for you? You know what I'm saying? All of these are like forms of uh, brainwashing. I just lean, lean right. into the opportunities. You said you want to you wanna run this this interview, and you know what it is since the day we met. We've been on that like... Always on that time. Yeah, always on that time. And yeah. we the programmers because humans is the real iPhones. No, for sure. So the people that can 
you know, say have you like saying a line over and over or singing something or you see a way somebody is dressed or colorway or even like the way uh, a girl is shaped or something or a new car shape that that that's the new form of programming now with this you know with the world wide web it's like yeah. that international influence why well, I, I don't know man he's just waffling i don't know i'm i'm bored he's waffling um again i probably should have watched this myself to pluck some bits from this i don't know what the fuck he's talking about i don't know what the point of this interview was they made people pay for this absolutely wild um yeah man we still we still have no idea why he doesn't like drake apart from him being in the good graces of dsps and in cahoots with record labels that seem to be his greatest crime is that drake is really popular and yeah he doesn't seem to like that okay i guess so man i understand i understand i understand i guess so at one point you were the head dog and now you're no longer the head dog i understand but I can't pretend to say I care. I really can't pretend to say I care. Um, big up, yeah, regardless. He's still my go. He's still my G. But it's just too much. It's just too much, man. It's just too much. I can't can't do all that shit. I really can't. So, um, that's it. That's the Agassino Zynga Show. Episode number what? 771. Thanks so much for tuning in. Pleasure to see your company, as per usual. If you're watching the live stream or if you're listening to the podcast make sure you like the stream make sure you leave me a five-star review wherever you see the fucking shows especially if you listen to it via the podcast app leave me a five-star review on apple Podcasts. leave me a five-star review on spotify wherever you're listening to this later on i'll be greatly appreciated for that um for those of you else who also want to help out you know little like on the stream would always definitely go a long way that's all i basically require from you and yeah, man, links and everything can be found in the description to get in touch with me or the stuff that I do. And I'm going to sign out with my tune of the day. My tune of the day for this particular, for this particular pod is going to be Couch Slut the Donkey. Couch Slut the Donkey is my tune of the day. Thank you for those of you who tuned in live. Thank you for those of you that might listen later. Love and appreciate you all. Take care. Enjoy the tune of the day. Mm -hmm.